And the fact that the Nature Discovery Park is there too, it's just a great um, symbiotic relationship and will really build on. The two parts will really complement each other beautifully. So thank you. Thank you. Barbara Hansen, been a member of this community since 1981. Redwood Mountain Fair is an amazing event. I've seen Bill Smallman there and he enjoyed it. We all had fun. The line for the beer was one third the size of the line for the water. Who was in line for the water? Women, children, babies. That is the most important thing we've got going for us at that fair. It gets hot and water is life. Please pay for that. Um, anybody in, out in Bath want to talk? Anybody out there? Okay. No. <clears throat> Jim Mosier, I'm a resident of Felton. I've been living in the Valley uh, since 1978 and in Santa Cruz County since 1965. Uh, and I've been very active in Felton in, uh, back about 10 years ago when we managed to be join, to work to join this district and we're very proud to be members of this district and to have gotten rid of uh, California America Water Company which served us so poorly. Um, I just want to speak to what I consider to be the false economy uh, of, uh, of the idea that cutting, these, uh, the cutting environmental programs uh, is where we need to go in order to make the district, uh, uh, make the budget uh, better. Uh, as uh, Director Smallman uh, said in the last meeting, uh, this will have little or no impact on race. These programs don't cost very much at all, yet they have a huge impact. Um, and uh, we need them for the reasons that other speakers have talked about. We need them in order to stay in the leadership role uh, in <coughs> environmental protection in the county and the region by stepping back and saying, no, this is not part of what we want to do, we're risking in the long term more state regulation, more intervention uh, that will be detrimental to the district, not only in terms of our environment, but also in terms of our budget. I also want to speak to the fact that the three of you new directors uh, talk in the campaign about how you are environmentalists. We don't need to talk about the environmental issues because we're all environmentalists here. I believe that's virtually a direct quote from the, uh, the uh, meeting we had at the, at the school, at the, school, the uh, candidates forum. Um, you, need to, you need to really prove that to us. And the budget decisions that, uh, at least preliminarily, have been made have put that into serious, serious question. And also, uh, Director Fultz, when you stated uh, that you question whether or not habitat restoration and protection should be part of the SLB Water District's mission. Um, I, I just found that astounding because it's so important that we have a healthy watershed in order to have clean water. It, to me, it's clearly part of the agenda. It's one of the main reasons why those of us in Felton work so hard to join the district. Um, and if you had made a statement like that during the campaign, it would have caused an uproar. Um, so I think it would be really helpful to have you clarify that and perhaps step back from it and embrace this agenda that the district has because it is so important uh, to the voters and to the ratepayers in the district. Thank you. Thank you. Bruce? Thanks. I'm uh, Bruce Holloway from Boulder Creek. Um, I just wanted to respond to Mr. Mosher. Um, I guess he was talking in broad brush fashion about environmental programs because this is the um, oral communications time, which wasn't really about any specific um, environmental program. But I just want to point out, you know, he said this district has been a leader. Um, I just want to remind everyone that 
Mr. Mosher wouldn't even have water out of this tap in Felton, except that this district violates its permit on Fall Creek, which was, uh, there's a, the conditions were put in place specifically for the protection of Salmonids. And this district has uh, ignored those, those uh, permit conditions uh, ever since it acquired the Felton system more than 10 years ago. Um, so rather than being a leader, this district is a violator, first of all, and secondly, has missed a golden opportunity to, to lead by, um, by trying to take, by, by trying to change the conditions of the permit to, to something that the district can actually comply with. Um, now Santa Cruz is taking the lead. Uh, so this district had a chance to take the lead and to, to be uh, a leader in the county setting policy uh, in this watershed. But we're letting the city of Santa Cruz do that and continuing to be a violator. And um, this district gives lip service to environment or has in the last 10 years, given lip service rather than compliance just lip service, uh, to raise awareness, public outreach, to wake, raise awareness while continuing to violate its own water permit. Um, so <laughs> I'm really waiting for the district to straighten up and um, comply with its permit and work to change the conditions of the permit so that you, you can do that. Anyone else want to comment? Anyone out there in the back? No? Okay. All right. Uh, we'll uh, move on um, to new business. Um, item A, there's vacancy in the elective office of the Board of Directors. And let me tell you how we're going to do this tonight. Uh, we're going to call on the applicants one at a time at, at, at the beginning, and, and we're going to go alphabetical. So it's, it's not uh, a question of somebody getting to talk first or somebody getting to talk last. Um, we're going to ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, they can make a brief statement if they want or not. Um, I'm going to ask, so this isn't a surprise to any of the people coming up here. I'm going to ask a few questions. Um, why do they want to be on the board? Uh, what they perceive as the biggest problem facing the district? Uh, if they understand the time commitment and if they know about a, the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency that we're involved in, uh, what they might know about that. Now, any other board members think there's going to be questions they want to ask, I would appreciate it if you would ask them right now so everybody has an idea of what. I know you, you, you know, you. Sounds like a good list. Okay, sounds like a good list to you. What do you think, Bob? I mean, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a Steve. Sounds a good list. Okay, and, and Bill, how do you feel about it? That, that sounds fine. Like okay, yeah. okay, so we don't want any, uh, sorry. Don't want anybody to not know what's going on here. Obviously, it seems like I didn't know what was going on. So, a after we go through the six people that have applied, we're going to conduct uh, public oral communications. You'll be able to speak. Um, it, it depends on how many of you want to talk. Um, I might say you only get two minutes instead of three minutes. So I will be asking for a show of hands. Um, after all of you have your say, then we're going to have a board discussion here. 
and will allow each director to speak at least once uh, before any motions are entertained. And if that's clear, is that clear to everybody? Okay. All right. So where are our six applicants? <laughs> running down the street now. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so Virgil would be the first one. Hi. <laughs> Can you hear me out there? <clears throat> Too bad. <laughs> My name is Virgil Champlin. I live in Brookdale. I... Put the mic up on me. Oh. Thank you. Um, I live in Brookdale and, uh, since 1984, and I'm, um, I think I said why I wanted to do this in my application. Um, but and everybody might not have seen your application, so could you repeat it, please? Um, I'm, I'm all about good governance, okay? It's not, it, you know, I've heard a lot of hyperbole tonight and very little fat. And it's about being involved in the discussion. It's about being involved in um, aligning the basic strategy of the water district with what 17,000 voters want. The people in this room are a very small part of that. And you have to keep the bigger picture in mind. And sometimes, you know, that's, that's hard. It's really hard. And I don't really want to do it. Um, but I found that by saying that, I'm pretty much a hypocrite. And I, can sit in the, I was born to be in the peanut gallery. And I can sit here at the last two years, almost every um, meeting, and give my opinion, my criticism, and stuff like that. But they have a really hard job balancing all of the, 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 the various issues that they have to deal with. And so, you know, I had to do this. <laughs> okay, so uh, you've told us why. Uh, what do you see as the biggest problem facing the district? Uh, yeah. um, Sorry, you're first. <laughs> yeah. I would have liked to have been able to copy somebody else. Um, <laughs> okay, I, I have three basic concerns, and I think they were part of the campaign. And that is um, reserves. There, that I don't think that's well attended. Um, infrastructure, I always hear complaints about infrastructure, and, and I agree. You know, when you have things that are, have a life expectancy of 30 years, and you're pushing 50 or 60, you've got to expect things to break. Um, and also finance. You can't go to the ratepayers every time you want to balance the budget. That's not the, I mean, sometimes that's true, but it's not always true. And so I consider a good balance. Engineering is all about balancing competing issues. And I think those are kind of competing issues, and I see that as balancing those three competing issues as the important thing. And, and, and don't get me wrong, I think the current board is doing a very good job. A little slow, um, but, you know, that's okay. I've got lots of time. Another year or two. Okay. Uh, what about time commitment? Because um, well, we have two board minutes board meetings a month, uh, or some, sometimes we might only have one, depending on what's coming up. Um, there are committee meetings, um, board member would need to be on it, uh, not as a, a, a member of the public, but as a board member on a committee. Um, there's a vacancy on Santa Margarita right now. So there, it takes time. It takes a lot of time and a lot of reading and, and asking questions. So what about your time? Have you got plenty of time? Well, it will interfere with some of my reading. Um, uh, the one thing, when I retired, the, um, the one thing that I, I discovered was 
now for the first time in my life, I actually set my own reading agenda. And I've gotten quite used to that. But, you know, okay, that's not an eight hour day. Okay. I have, yes, I, sadly, I have a lot of time. So, uh, <laughs> Santa Margarita, what about that? Well, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm confused by it. I went to the three day seminar that they had in Felton, and I thought that was wonderful. Um, I was really impressed by the facilitator. I mean, he was really good. Um, good sense of humor. Um, learned a lot. Uh, I'm concerned that we, hmm, we need to cooperate. It's a bigger problem from Scotts Valley and Santa Cruz than it is us. We need to make sure that our interests are um, exposed. Because, I mean, like over half of our water, I think, it comes from surface water. Uh, that's not true for the Santa Margarita aquifer. And so I think that we're a participant. We need to be judicious about that, but mm, skeptical. Okay. Thank you very much. Can I go now? <laughs> <laughs> yes, if you could ask Lou to come in. Lou is right here. Oh, Lou, I'm sorry, you were hiding behind James. I was. Hi, Lou Ferris from Felton. Uh, I was heartened to see that so many qualified individuals applied for this board position. I think that's important to try to be involved in your community, and this is a good example of that. I'm also looking forward to seating this position so that we can have a full board again and get on with more important matters. As far as general comments, that's all I have. Lois, if you'd like to ask your question, feel free. Uh, and why would you like to be on the board? Back in 2014, I served for a year on the Citizens Action Committee, along with several people in the audience today. Uh, since that time, I have spent an uh, inordinate amount of hours coming to board meetings. I think I've missed very few. Committee meetings, not so much, but I've been to most of the board meetings. And I've done a lot of reading and a lot of analysis and tried to offer some help and opinions uh, along the way. And to me, this is just a natural extension of that. Okay, uh, and what do you see as the biggest problem facing the district? The biggest fault problem facing the district is very clearly infrastructure. Uh, I think I have been very consistent on that bandwagon. Uh, every time something has come up about infrastructure, I have voted for it because I think that we are we're running out of time. There is going to be a major natural disaster like happened to Scotts Valley two years ago, but we're not going to be in the same position to react to it that they were. Uh, fortunately, they were able to, to take $3 million out of the bank, a Russian engineering job, drill 24-7, and then expedite the validation of the well. And they were back in business, actually at greater capacity. So they took a problem and made it into uh, a strength. Uh, I'm really worried that we will not be able to react as well because our expenses have ramped right up with our revenue over the last 12 years. And that's not a good situation. So uh, I think we need to find and spend a lot more money fixing our crumbling infrastructure, please. Okay. Um, time commitment. I think you already spend a lot of time here. That's right. <laughs> I don't think that's a problem because it hasn't been a problem in the past. In fact, if anything, I probably bug Rick too much. Right, Rick? No. <laughs> no, I do that. Okay. Um, how about Santa Margarita? I have to admit, I do not know a lot about Santa Margarita. I did go to the first uh, meeting of the Santa Margarita uh, Joint Powers Agency. I have done very little since because I have focused my time on what I think is the more important issue, which is those pressing issues with the Santa, the Santa Rosa Valley Water District, like infrastructure. But that's something I would need to come up to speed on. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Elaine. Hi, uh, I'm Elaine Fresco. I live in Felton also. And um, I recently uh, was, uh, my application was accepted to work on the environmental committee. 
And um, so I've begun to get involved in the water district. I want to express my appreciation to the board for accepting my application because I think um, I think you folks knew that I didn't completely agree with all your positions. And you appointed me anyway, and I think that says something for your uh, belief in accepting and listening to other people's opinions. And, and I thank you for that. Um, I also want to make sure that you know where I stand. I tried to express that in my application. I think um, basically the, the I agree that the infrastructure really needs help and it's been neglected for many years, way before even Cal-Am. Um, but I don't believe in indiscriminate cost cutting. And um, I think the main problem is coming up with the money to pay for the infrastructure. Um, I really like Director Swan's suggestion that we look for other sources of revenue. Uh, I think you said that at the last meeting. Yeah. Um, and I, but I think that just as important as uh, 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 repairing infrastructure is protecting and preserving our watershed. And I agree with many of the speakers this morning that that can't be neglected and we should be stewards of the watershed. Um, my uh, husband and I actually own two properties in Felton. And that means that we pay over a thousand dollars of about a thousand dollars of extra taxes every year to pay off the bond that was required to to buy the Felton watershed from Calais. And I don't begrudge the money. I am so grateful that our district is publicly owned, and um, and I think it's very important that we are not. Uh, uh, being run by a corporation that answers to shareholders and is uh, uh, focusing on profits. And uh, uh, one last thing I want to say before I answer your other questions is I just want to give a shout out to the staff of the Water District. Every single interaction that I've had with them, both on the boards and, and personally as a ratepayer, they have been completely professional and um, and just very impressive. And and I, I think, and no one has said this to me, but I think the turnover to a new board could be somewhat destabilizing and demoralizing. And I think it's very important that we support and appreciate the staff. Well, I thank you for that because I really support the staff. And all of them, all of them. Good. And I don't want them to disappear. Okay. I said at last meeting, I'll say it again. I'm glad to hear that. They're going to have to lock me up to get me to vote to get rid of stuff. Uh, okay. That's okay. <clears throat> it's not my turn to talk. <laughs> um, <clears throat> oh, so why do you want to be on the board? Well, basically, I, I feel like it, it, like there has to be a different viewpoint on the board. and. And, and I'm very environmentally committed, and that's why. Okay. Um, and what do you see as the biggest problem facing? Well, I think it is finding the money to pay for the infrastructure. Okay. And not and and, and I and I really don't think that we should be making some of the cuts that have been made. Okay. And what about time commitment? If you were on the board, it's it's a horrible time commitment. I, I would be willing to do it, but I think, oh my God, what a thankless job. <laughs> and you ought to have my job. I have more meetings than anybody, except staff, of course. Um, what about um, San Margarita Groundwater Agency? Do you know anything about that? I know very little about it. I would need to get up to speed. I haven't been to any of the meetings. I've heard discussion uh, during the campaign and and during other meetings, um, and I know it has to do with our cooperation with other water districts. And uh, it's predict yeah. protecting the aquifer, what it is, not overdrafting. Well, how could anyone oppose that? <laughs> I, know. I know, it's just a complicated issue. Right, right, right. Okay. 
All, All right. right. Thank you, Elaine. Okay, uh, Beth. Sorry, a little slow. I slipped up in Montana Glacier Park last month and broke my ankle, but it was a beautiful view as I was lying there. Um, just recovering now. So I'm Beth Hollenbeck, and I appreciate you having me speak and accepting my application. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about my background. I was born in Felton in 1963, so I was born and raised here, and I have a lot of community commitment. Um, I, I love my valley. I feel like it's polarized in many ways, and I would like to be somebody that could help maybe get it not to be so polarized, too. I think I'm a pretty good negotiator. I've done that in my two teaching um, jobs, one at San Lorenzo Valley and now at Scotts Valley High and, and Middle School. I get zero money for all my music programs, so I'm really good at building programs with zero money. I'm a fixer, that's what I've done. I also worked in Los Angeles back in the day for iMagnin for $3 million companies, um, for the fragrance company of iMagnin, and I was charged in the buying office of consolidating and fixing the budget for the fragrance department there, and, and I did it. Um, so I, that's what I do, I like to come in, I'm a big spatial thinker, I can see things. Um, I helped organize and, and co-found San Lorenzo Valley Citizens Organized for Responsible Ecology, SLB Core. And after I graduated from Leadership Santa Cruz in 2007, I partnered with Laura Casa from Save Our Shores and brought the river cleanup to Felton at the Covered Bridge. And did that for eight years or so and, and then turned it over to Valley Women's Club, graciously took it over at that point. Um, but the rivers mean everything to me. This is what I, where I grew up. Um, this is the water we drink. I live on Fall Creek. I watch the water go past our house every day. Um, so I just wanted to be a part of this board to help make decisions both, both fiscally. Um, employment, uh, I think, is great here. I know people that have worked here, and you know, this is a wonderful water, water company. Um, I'm also an educator. I have a master's in teaching. So I would like to actually see how we can help partner with educational, um, environmental uh, things that go on in the San Lorenzo Valley. And it doesn't necessarily all have to be money. Uh, that's what I do. I find partnerships and work together, or we find money somewhere else. Somebody mentioned that already. I'm really good at finding money somewhere else. I found $35,000 in a month last year when the Scotts Valley School District's budget got cut. So, um, so all my programs are still in place this year. Um, so that, but that comes with growing up in this community, having connections. Um, I'm, I know a lot of people in Scotts Valley, San Lorenzo Valley, and so I'd like to be able to utilize that. Okay. Thank you. Um, so why would you like to be on the board? I think you just said. I think I just said all that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, again, I like to serve. I like I love my community. Um, I've been involved with the chambers. Many people know I've been vice president of our San Lorenzo Valley Commerce uh, Chamber of Commerce for uh, seven years. I've done job fairs in our community. You know, I, I know what it means to do things for our community and, and not get paid anything. But we do it because we love our community, and we want our community to thrive. And we have an amazing community. So. Um, that's one reason why I'd love to serve on this board. Okay. Uh, and what do you see as the biggest challenge or issue facing this district? Well, I think um, one thing that this, the San Lorenzo Valley Water District faces is just, again, that polarization that's been going on in the last 10 years. I've been in a few board meetings myself where um, you know, I was shut down or nobody would shake my hand. And I, I mean, we live together. This is our community. And we're trying to have conversations. And they need to be civil. And they need to be, um, you know, I'll just address the elephant in the room. I did the commercial for Cal-Am at the time because when I did vote for Flo, um, I had just moved back in the, to the area. And, it, you know, it was kind of presented to me of our water's going to be outsourced and the rates are going to go up. They're going to skyrocket. and. Um, you know, 
and Sylvie Water wants to acquire it, and that's all sounded good to me. Um, it was afterwards that it kind of hit me that it wasn't really for sale, and it went to that huge lawsuit, and then the money got bigger and bigger, and we ended up paying a lot more, and then the rates started going up and up and up. And when Callion called me from Monterey, it was at a time where all that was kind of coming to fruition. And at first I said, no, no way, I'm not doing it. And then I read an article about a judge in Monterey that um, ruled that Water Now at the time in Monterey was ma making false accusations and statements about Cal Lamb. And it's one thing to have a fight, but have a fair fight. You know, don't make false accusations. Don't say things, and to have a judge have to come in and rule that you know they were basically lying about the company. I thought, okay, that's not fair. The the people of Monterey can make a fair decision with the truth, based in facts, and not just a bunch of demonization and hype. And you know, let's let's keep it clean. Let's keep it with dignity, and let's keep it factual. And and I felt that that was something that that needed they needed to hear. Uh, what about time commitment? So, <laughs> okay, yes, it's, it's a big t time commitment, but I am going part-time in teaching next year, so I've cut back to 60%, and um, I actually have, I just work a, like an hour Thursday morning, so that's nice that the meetings would be. Um, I do have a commitment to go to Montana in June, and so that way I could do meetings from Montana, but you know, being it's May right now, it was just too hard to to cancel all that. So that is something that I wanted the board to be aware of, and I'm absolutely willing to do that by call or whatever you need me to do. Um, so, uh, what about Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency? So being involved in Scotts Valley and you know driving up and down Scotts Valley Drive every day to go to work, um, I, I'm. I'm <coughs> And being on the chamber, I've been involved with conversations between our water district and the Scotts Valley Water District. So I realize Santa Margarita isn't, it's a countywide mandate that everybody's trying to work together on to make sure that we are um, recharging the groundwater basin. But also, to my understanding, it's stabilized. But what I would really like to be careful with the Santa Margarita is to make sure that we don't get too comfortable. And, and start, you know, getting, um, drawing too much water out or not, not keeping vigilant, in other words, about what we're already doing. Let's, let's not just fix it and move on. Let's, let's stay the course and let's make these changes go into perpetuity because we're only growing more and more in, in, in our area. And we've got to make sure that our water is protected. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Brian. Uh, Brian. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for letting me uh, speak, director, staff, uh, neighbors, friends. Um, I'm Brian Largay. I live in Felton, and uh, it's an honor to be here. I have uh, great respect for other folks applying for this uh, position, Beth in particular, and Lee. I've worked with both of them for a long time, and um, it's uh, really exciting to see enthusiastic expressions of support for service. Um, the, um, I, just to describe a little bit about my experience and background, um, the, uh, the reason I'm here is because water is life, and uh, if we don't take care of it, we put ourselves and our communities in great jeopardy. Uh, because of that, I chose to dedicate my professional career to it. I uh, got my master's in hydrologic sciences at Davis and uh, spent my career working for uh, private entities, nonprofits, and for profits, and special districts on water resources. Um, uh, these include the RCD of Santa Cruz County, um, the Elkhorn Slough National Estuarine Research Reserve. Uh, my own consulting firm and um, the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County, where I've been most recently. Um, direct application of water resource management. Uh, some examples of that is I oversee a ranch in Watsonville where we just put in a thousand gallon per minute well and uh, implemented water savings practices that cut our use by 100 million gallons a year. Um, 
The, uh, we run a number of managed aquifer recharge projects, nitrate remediation projects. Uh, I've done road and erosion control projects in the Santa Cruz Mountains and other parts of the county. I, I'm responsible for 16,000 acres of land, uh, including uh, management for endangered species, uh, forests where we do sustainable logging, uh, recreational trails. And as part of my work, I uh, am a big fan of ruthless prioritization to make sure that we have the resources to stick to our mission and get what we need to get done. Um, I'm a big fan of our community here in the Valley. I'm on the board of the San Lorenzo Valley Foundation for Education and uh, advocate a lot for pedestrian safety along Highway 9. Um, and uh, I think that uh, uh, some things that I would want to work towards would be a transparency on the board. I was on the committee that uh, and personally made the recommendation that the district enroll in the um, uh, certificated transparency program. I forget what it's called exactly, but um, I think that's important. Uh, I think that rates are very important. The cost of living here is astronomical and uh, it puts an enormous strain on all members of our community. And if we can do things that leave dollars in people's pockets, that makes our community stronger and healthier. Um, I also think uh, good wages are very important for <laughs> staff. I uh, would expect people to work very hard at their jobs and be highly productive, which means their job would be stressful. And it's important that they not carry that stress home and be able to stay employed at the district. So I would encourage good wages for staff. Um. Okay, um, so you told us a lot about it yourself. Uh, why do you want to be on this board? Uh, I, uh, service to communities is very important to me. And I think that the um, uh, district uh, needs good leadership, has good leadership, and we all got to do our part. Okay, uh, what do you see as the biggest challenge to this district? I think if you look at rainfall maps of our region, uh, there is a bullseye on the Santa Cruz Mountains with a lot of rain here and um, millions of people and tens of thousands of acres of farmland surrounding us with very little water. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to keep on a, an eye on what we've got and do our best to protect it because uh, it's valuable. Um, time commitment. I am uh, extraordinarily concerned about the time commitment. I have a full-time job and kids in the local schools. And uh, I'm very, really relieved that there are other people here tonight also. <laughs> um, and about Santa Margarita groundwater efficiency. I think that the uh, Santa Margarita Aquifer is and the um, coordinated management of it with our neighboring districts uh, is essential to good uh, resource stewardship of both our groundwater and our surface water. I think that the um, conjunctive use, which is the co-management of resources where in some years you use, uh, in wet years you use your creeks and in dry years you use your groundwater <laughs> and um, try to manage aquifer recharge and coordinate with other um, and agencies to share water will be very important. I think getting the agreements written uh, in a robust manner that prevents our water from getting stolen is also very important. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Lee? Oh, there you are. I didn't see you back there in the corner. So hard. <laughs> There's a lot of great stories and a great uh, background. It's been very interesting listening to everyone on um, their presentation. Um, my name is Lee, and um, I'm open up my notes here to make sure I get to everything. Um, I've been living in uh, Boulder Creek for about 17 years in the San Lorenzo Valley for 23. And um, I recently retired a couple of years ago and uh, was working mostly for parks. So the last 16 years at Quail Hollow Ranch County Park. Prior to that, for many years, was California State Parks. And um, basically what I was doing is kind of two-pronged. One was working um, with volunteers and networking with um, a lot of uh, other uh, community organizations and uh, 
environmental organizations to improve the environmental and historic integrity of Cuevalo Ranch. So that was working with California Native Plant Society to um, pull out room, working with uh, Santa Cruz Bird Club to install nest boxes to attract back in um, uh, species uh, like the, uh, um, the western bluebird to nest in the sound of the valley again. It hadn't been for a long time. And so um, did a lot of that kind of work. And then also I was um, doing a lot of interpretive programs. So um, <coughs> basically education. And so there's this environmental educational um, background that I have for 35 years. Um, I also had a, the challenge of working on a shoestring budget. As many of you know, for a number of years, the um, county park system got folded into public works. Our budget kind of evaporated. We lost a lot of staffing. And um, we had to just make do with, I mean, literally, for half of our fiscal year, I was operating out of a donation jar. So you do what you have to do in order to cover the bases. Um, so from that standpoint, I, I have an appreciation for, um, I, I'm, I'm moderate politically, really. Um, so on, in certain respects, when it comes to social issues, um, especially number one, the environment, number two, education, I'm very liberal. It's like that, we really gotta work on that. But on the other hand, I'm a fiscal conservative because I've had to be with my jobs. And personally, I am. I, I live a pretty simple lifestyle. I can um, retire here in Santa Cruz fairly comfortably because I live pretty simply. Um, so there's this two-pronged side that um, I think is something that comes up a lot. And I think, um, especially in today's um, uh, climate, uh, political climate, there's this tendency to pull apart into two sides. And I don't think that's really necessary. I think that, that the middle ground, there's a lot of value to finding that middle ground. Um, that there, there, is, there are a lot of um, environmental programs that we need to fund. Yet at the same time, we do need to make sure that we have a, a lean um, financial you know, um, budget in order to accomplish, in order to, to keep rates from um, going up too high and, to, and also in order to um, have enough money to fund the, the, the programs that we really need to do. So um, it's about, I think, having priorities and keeping true to those priorities. So. Yeah. so <laughs> Why do you want to be on this board? Why do I want to be on the board? Um, I, I do a lot of volunteer work. I'm a volunteer coordinator, and there's been periods in my life where I just dove in headlong into significant volunteer opportunities. I was a Peace Corps volunteer for two years in the early 90s. In the early 2000s, I was a CASA volunteer, which meant working with a couple of kids in foster care, but also attending a lot of them. I wrote more court reports than I care to account. Um, and I did that for about six years. Um, and so it's been a while since I've dove in again. And it's an opportunity to do something that's really important in our community, to, um, to address the water. So it's time. So what do you see as our biggest challenge in the district? Um, I've heard this said over and over again, and I have to agree, infrastructure. Um, to me, I look at the mission statement. The mission statement has these four parts to it. There's, um, there's high quality water, there's um, outstanding service, which means efficient systems to get the water to customers, there's, um, there's environmental health, and there's fiscal vitality. And so when I look at that, the one that seems to be the most lacking is that one that has to do with the um, the infrastructure, the getting an efficient system to get water to the customers. And that would be the number one priority in my eyes. Okay. Um, what about time commitment? As I mentioned before, um, I'm, I'm uh, retired. Um, so, and, and I do periodically do a lot of volunteer work. I'm already volunteering in various places and county parks and state parks. And that would probably reduce, make time for this, but I have plenty of time. So that's not a problem. And the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency? Yes, I went to all three meetings in Felton. I think it was a great idea. Um, and it's something that, with my background in networking with a lot of um, various organizations to work on various issues at Pearl Hollow, it's something I feel that there's some overlap with that. And it's something that 
I think is a valuable um, asset and something that really that this district district needs to be part of. Thank you very much. Um, Virginia. I feel honored to be a part of all the people that have been speaking to you tonight. tonight. It's, it's impressive to hear everyone's stories, as you said. And um, it's impressive to see your work in Lois. So thank you for being a good chairperson. That's such a valuable skill. <laughs> I've spent my professional life um, working in fundraising and executive management. I've worked with cities and counties on plans. I um, have an MBA from Santa Clara University with a focus in marketing and communications. And I have raised millions of dollars primarily in Santa Cruz County for a number of kinds of activities. In my work with um, counties and cities, I have brought people together in order for them to do things together, primarily in the arts, but also in other kinds of activities. Um, I'm also, when I'm sitting in this room and I'm thinking about who I am and why I want to be involved, is that this is where my heart is. I love this place. My great-grandfather came to Boulder Creek to start the first high school here. Um, my family moved away, but then my parents and sisters and brother, they all moved back. My, my parents' are ashes are scattered up a um, Bear Creek Road. In 1982, I was a teenager living in Boulder Creek when I walked up Highway 9, and it was a mud, flat road, and I walked into Felton Grove, and I dug mud out of homes so people could hopefully move back in. Then later, when I was red-tagged for my property <laughs> on Alva Road, um, my husband and I moved in to Felton Grove, and so I have a very close relationship with the river. <laughs> I stood in that river in my garage. <laughs> so I'm very committed to the community, and I, and I have a lot of skills. I've recently left my position um, of development director for Community Bridges, which operates Mountain Community Resources in Felton. I recently left there to work as a consultant, so I'm working out of my home office in Felton now. And I have a lot of skills, uh, not about water, but about community engagement and about participation and about marketing and communications and listening and budgets and planning and strategic planning. And so that's my background. Pretty impressive. Uh, uh, why do you want to be on this board? <laughs> well, that's why. I want to make a contribution. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, um, to so I will ask you, what do you see as the biggest issue here for the water district? With my background, it's about um, pulling everyone together. You know, in fundraising and in, and in um, advocacy, when you bring people together, you can do so you can, and, and there's real skills to that. There's, like, people know about water, well, I know about how to do that. You know, it's, you, um, you have to listen and you have to communicate, and then there's ways that you can bring people together so that more can get done. You could raise money. I've heard that a few times. I don't know the details of raising money for water districts, so I don't know exactly. But I know, like, the library in Felton is a great example. It's Sure, there's public money for libraries, but what's the vision of the community? How do we draw people together, and how do we raise more money for the things we want to do? So I believe in that. I, I've worked in many cities where a lot more was done. Things were moved forward when people were working together. And so the biggest thing I think that's what I would work on is how do we work together as a community to get the things that we need done for the water system. Um, Time commitment. <coughs> yes, so I'm still working, so there's that, but I'm working now on, at home. I'm on four volunteer projects right now, <laughs> so I suppose if I get this one, I might step back from one of the others um, because I believe it. So I have time to, to do it. Okay. And uh, what about Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency? I don't know much about it other than that it's a joint agreement. I have worked on joint agreements in other places. In, well, the closest place, I guess, is Watsonville, where 
I worked at the city of Watsonville in the, the theater there in the high school um, to do a joint re, and I worked with them so they renegotiated their agreement so it worked better for all three parties. And I know water is complicated, but theaters are, and high schools are really complicated. <laughs> so I don't know about this Santa Margarita, but I, I get the larger picture of working together. Well, thank you very much. Okay, I am just <clears throat> absolutely overwhelmed at all the fantastic people who apply to be on this board. It's, it's going to be a tough decision, but let's hear from the public now. Um, and I would like to know <clears throat> how many of you think you want to talk about the applicants for the water district. Okay, how about out there in the back? <laughs> Oh, okay. So you can have three minutes. Doesn't seem that much. So those of you in the back got to come inside. There's a whole chair in here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're not even me. Right. <laughs> well, let's line up next to John. <laughs> I wouldn't want your job, <laughs> but I am so proud to be here on behalf of Beth Hollenbeck. I've known her since she was 12. And in my later years as a recruiter, I would say she was my ideal candidate. And why? Because she has an incredible work ethic. She's good for her word, tireless and dedicated. And she loves this San Lorenzo Valley. And uh, it's an honor just to speak on her behalf. I mean, usually I'm not out and about at this hour, <laughs> but I made the effort to, <laughs> to say uh, it means a lot to have someone like Beth in your sights. Uh, I would say anyone would be lucky to have her join the team. She is a natural leader, but she gets along with everybody and knows how to rally, to raise money, to bring people together, has learned how to be open to people's thoughts and opinions and value everybody equally. I admire her tremendously and you certainly do have, typical of our wonderful valley, some wonderful candidates. So good luck, folks. <laughs> I'm voting for Beth. <laughs> Thank you for the time. I'm Jean Rackford from Belton. Um, I have to say that having worked on the Citizens Advisory Committee with both Lou and um, Brian, I admire both of them for their ongoing commitment to the Water District. They've been involved for years, and they've been coming to meetings on a regular basis, so I think that demonstrates real commitment. However, I understand that a lot of other people have only recently gotten interested, so I'm not going to say just because they haven't been coming to meetings for years doesn't mean they shouldn't be on the board because that's not fair. Um, one candidate was a real standout because the core mission, if you go back to this, is water. And uh, Brian Largay, he really focused on water. It's not just because his professional background, it's because that's what obviously impels him to be concerned about this. Water is our primary mission. We're a resource agency, we provide water. Um, infrastructure is important, and there are, you know, with current rate structure, we can replace infrastructure, but that's not cogent, relevant at the moment. What's important is infrastructure won't help if your watershed's in bad shape, if your groundwater agreement is unfair, if there are threats to your water supply from outside um, uh, players. Protecting the water is the number one job of directors through policies, through financial planning through other things that are in the purview of the directors. Um, his work as a um, hydrologist or a hydro engineer 
forgot exactly what it was, not is not relevant to his role as director. The knowledge of the regional water situation is very, very important. The groundwater uh, legislation, the most important piece of water legislation in the last 100 years in California, really critical. Um, infrastructure seems important, but it's been in the water game for a couple of years. You realize that the big 400-pound gorilla is the groundwater legislation. That's really critical. I admire um, other people's commitment to community service, and I agree that's a huge commitment of time. But again, Ryan expressed concern having served on citizen advisory with him. We had a meeting. He came back the next time with this multi, you know, two-page, bullet-pointed, extremely cogent summary of an action plan. The rest of us were just like scribbling on yellow legal pads. Um, so he may not have a tremendous amount of time, but he's really effective. And um, that's the only time I've worked with him uh, was on the Citizen Advisory Committee. But he clearly was very focused, extremely productive, and very efficient. He didn't waste a lot of time, you know, fiddle paddling around. He really seemed to, and I think that's often the case with busy people. Um, it sounds like many of the people here would be willing to sacrifice and prioritize serving on the board. And I've talked about this in the past when there were problems with directors being able to attend meetings and so forth. It should be a priority. Public service is a priority. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jim Mosier from Felton. Um, I want to echo what you said, Lois. It's just uh, a really impressive group of people who have applied. I'm very pleased with all, all of the applications um, and uh, that we have such interest and such a passion and expertise being offered. Uh, for you all and uh, in, in making a very difficult choice. Um, and that includes uh, uh, Beth Hollenbeck's uh, application in the sense that she has been a very valuable contribution, com contributor to the Valley, um, and I honor that. Uh, but I don't believe she is qualified for this board because of the stance she has taken on uh, the private ownership of water. Now, she did talk about the ad. Um, I was... Uh, I wasn't, I can't speak to what the judge did in Monterey, but I can tell you the most deceptive part of Callahan's campaign in Monterey was the ad that she did. Mm -hmm. uh, because the ad, first of all, purported, at least implicitly, to be speaking for many, many people in Felton, uh, and that what we had learned in Felton, according to the ad, <coughs> was that going into a public water system was worse than being owned by California <coughs> Americans. This is a company. Uh, that grossly mismanaged the Felton watershed. It imposed huge rate increases. We went repeatedly, we spent literally thousands of volunteer hours taking this company on. We had to go to San Francisco to the Public Utilities Commission, which we called the Private Utilities Commission because they were controlled by the companies uh, and got nowhere. Their rates increases were astronomical every year. They had no interest in the watershed. They had no interest in collaborating with other agencies in the area. And they had no customer service. Uh, they had a PR guy from Sacramento who came in two or three days a week. Beth, Beth did not reach out to any of us who worked tirelessly to join this district and then uh, went ahead with this ad uh, that may have been uh, motivated by the fact that the judge corrected some things that the public water advocates had made. Calam, by the way, sued us using a similar strategy of going after our ad, which is hyperbole. We all know that in these ads. Uh, they lost in our case. Um, but they are a really, really bad company. And the idea that this company would be better for Felton than the San Lorenzo Valley Water District was just, it was insulting to those of us who worked so tirelessly to join this district so that we could have meetings like this. Because we didn't have those opportunities with cal -Am to speak to our neighbors, to speak to you board members who are our neighbors, and to let you know what our concerns are. Just as in, in the campaign, as heated as it was, we had the opportunity to make a local decision. That's what we fought for in Felton. And I don't believe you should uh, put someone on the board who would be an advocate for private companies owning the district. Thank you. Next. 
Hello, Jonathan Solis from Dalton again. Um, I would really like to see you appoint Brian. I know he's he has a passion and a quality to uh, water and to the aquifers. He's got qualifications. And he has a lot of experience working so hard to defend water and to make sure that people uh, have enough of it. And, and conserving water. And I'd really, really like to see a point him. Uh, I think he's the best qualified. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm April Zilger. I live in Felton. I moved there in 2004, right around the time that the struggle to turn this into a public agency was really heating up. So I was very excited when it worked. I don't mind paying the extra tax. Um, as far as the candidates, I mean, it's impressive how many really well-qualified candidates you've attracted for this opening. And I just want to say that as a former scientist, I have a doctorate in plant biology, um, it's important to me to make sure there's still some science background on this board. And so I particularly was interested in Brian Largay, um, Lee Summers, with her background, Lou Ferris with his chemistry degree and biotech industry background in water. And um, even Elaine Fresco had to take a bunch of science to have her career as a nurse. So I feel like any of those candidates would be great. And I also was really impressed with Virginia Wright with all of her um, local government management and fundraising experience. So yeah, there's those two sides. There's the background in science side, and then there's the experience with collaborative work between agencies and communities and community engagement. That's also very important. So good luck making your decision. Thank you. Is there anyone out there in the back who wants to? Oh, okay. Um, okay. My friend. Um, this is truly an embarrassment of riches. Yeah. I think we should increase the board by seven members. <laughs> 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 I think Could you introduce I'll, yourself? I'm sorry? Could you introduce yourself? Deborah Lowen. Thank Mom, you so you much. Um, there is a lot of partisanship that's been going on in this district that's very unfortunate. And I agree with all the, the speakers who said we need to work more collaboratively. We need to work through this and, we'll, and work together. And so, I don't know what would be the least polarization person to, to appoint. And I'll leave that to you. But my personal opinion is only one person that I know the best, and that's Lou Ferris. I know um, he's been attending meetings for quite a while. I know he's on the engineering committee. And I've talked to him in meetings and afterwards, and I'm really impressed by what he knows. And what's most impressive to me is he's not part of the polarization at all separate of it, he does have a science background, and the, the focus is on infrastructure. And what I see is this district is moving in that direction, and it's a whole new direction. And so to me, the benefit of having the Ferris is someone who's already, he's already hit the ground running. He knows everything that's going on. He's worked with Rick Rogers. He has a really full idea of what he's getting into, and he has a full idea of what the infrastructure is. And the other part of my comment is, I hope everybody stays for the presentation by James. And <laughs> because this is the heart of the district of his department in, in treatment and in operations is working smoothly and has enough funding. Everything else is going to fall in place as well. So I please encourage you to stay and listen to that. It's really important. You know, I was going to suggest that to people. I didn't put her Please up to leave. doing it <laughs> because it's really important you hear what what he has to say. Um, okay, how about out there in the hinterlands? Any more talkers? No? No? Yeah. All right. I I guess it's uh, now time for uh, board members to uh, 
have their say, what they think, and this is going to be hard. Bill, would you like to start? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm really blown away. Yeah, I mean, just like, uh, it gets seven, you know, like what Lua said, it's just, you know, this, this is going to be a very tough decision. But however, I've reviewed, you know, I've, I reviewed um, all your applications, and uh, I, I, with the words that you spoke, uh, I was, you know, I actually kind of changed because some of the people that spoke here really hit some uh, notes for me. So I, I, I'm not sure if this is appropriate, but you know, but you can say can who I say who the who you like. I, I you don't have, get to make a motion or anything. no, no, no. I'm gonna just say my top two, top two. Yes, please. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll mention the three and four, though, but I'll, I won't. Okay, I'll, <laughs> let, I'll let you say three. Yeah, okay, so anyway, my, my, my top pick is Lou, um, basically, because, and I just know, I feel that he's, uh, he will, uh, you know, he, he's been involved here, he's been at the, uh, the uh, thing. I voted, he applied once before, when we had another position before, and I voted for him, because, uh, uh, um, just because a lot of things, because he's and, but he's also a chemist, and water quality is really quite complicated. And he is a chemist, so I, you know I think that would be a benefit. But I think he he's got a kind of a you know which, from what Debbie said, he's just sort of concerned about the infrastructure, and that's really where we're my focus is for this district. Um, and I, I, anyway, so it would think. Uh, second, Virgil. Uh, you know, Virgil also has been here, and one thing that he said that really hit home with me is he um, he makes decisions and tries to figure out what the the majority of the community wants. And this is a hard job; it's a thankless job, and that's what I I try to do. I I try to think about what the public wants, and so that it, to me, him saying that. Um, I, I think that he would be a very quality person. Um, and, the, and the other people, you know, Lee and Virginia, wow, I mean, I, I was, you know, I almost was leaning towards you after what you spoke tonight. And then there's the other three people that uh, I, I'm putting at the bottom of my list. I mean, I just, it's not, nothing personal, you know, I think there's, there's just, there's a couple issues there that, yeah, I think you know, <laughs> you know, we had a couple differences or whatever, and it, I, you know, I mean, I, yeah, you're all, you're, you're superhero people, but um, anyway, that you know, that you know, it's a tough decision, you know, for me to, to make that decision. So anyway, I've gone Lou number one, Virgil number two. So. Thank you, uh, Steve. Would you like this? Sure. Uh, I do appreciate everybody's. Uh, of application and and it does look like there are seven really good candidates for the uh, for the opening. I I do agree that there's a, a big time commitment that a lot of people might have issues with. Uh, I certainly discovered that there's more of a time commitment than I was actually expecting in this position. Um, and so you do have to make other sacrifices as well. And, and I know how difficult that can be. I do think there's a lot of advantages though with the uh, as Bill mentions, uh, uh, Lou's got some great opportunities and advantages. I think Virgil wrote the best application. I got to do that. But, but, uh, but being familiar with the district, being familiar with the staff, knowing the existing challenges that are already in, in, involved within the district, uh, the availability of the time, uh, existing commitments to be at all the board of directors meetings and participating in the engineering committee. Um, I, I, and even being Santa Cruz's volunteer uh, of the year last year, I think Lou is uh, a phenomenal candidate and we'd be lucky to, to have him. That being said though, uh, all, of the, all of the candidates I think are extremely, uh, would be extremely valuable members of the board. So I'd be happy to support virtually all of them at this point. But, uh, Personally, I think that Lou has brings the most opportunity, as Debbie said, to hit the ground running and be able to contribute at a, at a very high level immediately. So that's my thoughts on this. 
Let's see, do I want to let you go next, or <laughs> I can go? Well, wow, it's a hard one, isn't it? <laughs> I, um, I would love to see another woman on the board, but I get along okay with these guys. You know, I can beat them into submission <laughs> if I must. Um, I, I think, well, Virgil was so funny. He would be the life of the board. Um, but I think I have to go with um, Bill and Steve and say that I think it should be Lou. He's been to all these meetings. He's on the engineering committee. He's gone. Uh, he's taken a tour of the treatment plant, which I haven't been able to get yet. Sorry, Ken. Um, he has a. Well, you have to do that. I can't ask staff to do anything. I can only ask. That's all you got to do. That's right. Yeah, well, he ignores. <laughs> so. I, I guess I, uh, it's, this is a tough decision because I really like so many of you, so many of you women, uh, you all sounded so fabulous. I've uh, dealt with the community bridges when Long Pico got a grant from the state. I was down there at community bridges signing my name 40 million times. Uh, uh, but they were helping me, they at least dated, so I didn't have to do the date, just mm -hmm. sign my name. Uh, I, I, I love Quail Hollow Ranch. I love the state parks. Um, I, I, I've lived in this valley since 71. And it isn't easy for a, a widow to live in Long Beach for almost 50 years. Um, but, so I appreciate all you, uh, all the women, Beth, uh, uh, don't let me forget somebody here, Brian. Uh, oh, Elaine. Uh, so they're, right, um, Lee and Virginia. Just, they're great, they're great. Uh, but I, I guess I'm going to go with uh, Okay. I give you an, well, an that's, opportunity. That's, that's great. Um, what Say would, what you think. Well, what I would like to do is take all seven people uh -huh. and put all the skill sets in the room. Uh, the, the, uh, oh, there's four, four five, six, seven. seven. Sorry. Sorry. I said six. Um, the diversity of skill sets and background that has been shown in the applicants is just phenomenal. And um, I think that speaks a lot to how the community views the importance of this locally owned district, owned by the people. And I think a real um, commitment on the part of the community to serve that district. So to all of you that applied, Thank you. And for those that might have been on the fence, go ahead and do it next time. We will have other openings for committees and ad hoc committees or uh, citizen committees coming up, I'm sure. So your opportunity to serve will continue to be there. Um, when I look at what I think the district needs the most right now, I think it does have to do with creating partnerships and working through some of the issues that we face today by having those conversations, which are going to be tough conversations, there's no question about it, but by having those conversations and by having people who are part of um, the fabric of the community who have been here a long time um, is really important. And I also think that the board needs to also have a little diversity on it as well. I actually have three people that I would support 
though I could vote for anybody. Mm -hmm. And um, those three people would be uh, Lee Summers, Beth Hollenbeck, and Elaine Fresco. And it's not necessarily that all three of these folks are going to agree with me on everything. But I think they bring to the board mm -hmm. a different set of skills that are really essential at this point. Um, however, given that that is a minority view uh, with what everybody else has said, um, it doesn't look like um, any of those three people would necessarily be able to make the board, uh, for which I'm sorry to say. Um, but there will be other times and other opportunities. So um, I know Elaine can, will hopefully continue to serve on the Environmental Committee. Thank sure. you very much. We had some great conversations. And Lee, I look forward to getting to know you better. Hopefully we'll be able to uh, work together as well. And Beth, as you know, uh, we've worked together on a lot of things over a lot of years. And um, I would like to be able to work with you here. I don't think that's going to happen. Well, uh, one thing I would like to say, thank you. The seven people we at the admin committee and we're talking about what we're going to do with the buildings. Yes, right. Uh, what are we going to do for them. our staff? Yeah. And maybe those seven people are, maybe they're people that can help us with that. Well, I think so. And we also have some people that applied for committees that didn't get on committees that we might want to go back and take another look at <coughs> if they would like to serve in that kind of a role as well. Okay. So, um, can I ask for an, a motion here? I'd like to make a motion to appoint Lou Ferris as a uh, fill the vacancy for the board. Yeah. Uh, you'll okay. second. Okay. Uh, Holly? I'm sorry, did I hear a second? Yeah. Yes. Second. Okay. Director Smallman? Aye. Director Swan? Yes. President Henry? Yes. Director Falls? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank all of you. And we'd love for you to stick around and listen. He, he's he's very he's very bashful. So can we take a little break for a second? Five Come in for the swearing in of our new board member. Be appreciated. Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith. That I will bear true faith. And allegiance to the Constitution. And allegiance to the Constitution. Of the United States. Of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. And that I take this obligation freely. And I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. And I will well and faithfully discharge. The duties upon which I am about to enter. The duties upon which I'm about to enter. 
and make sure everything's going smoothly and as it should out in the field, make sure everybody's being safe out there and all that. Um, the field services supervisor himself takes care of all the district service orders, district work orders, and runs the projects that are internal. He's not really as involved with the projects that are outside where we get contractors involved and stuff like that. That's the field assistant coordinator. So that's the organization chart of the operations department. So the operating budget for the operations department. Um, we start with the contract professional services. So this consists of outside contractors and professionals that come in to do things that are not as capital projects, but the things that are doing for maintenance and infrastructure keep up not as much as capital projects where you'd be out for bid for something mm -hmm. like that. Those are capital projects that are out of a different budget. It's still in this budget, but it's not in this budget. And then outside water analysis. We have a lot of outside water analysis due to sampling of our water, and that, uh, that also pays for that. Then you have operating expenses. So the operating expenses does operating supplies, like non-inventory parts that we don't have an in inventory, we have to go to the store and get, it pays for that, hardware, and supplies. So anything that we don't have an in inventory is operating supplies. Small tools, small tools. Every truck that we have here at the district and every plant and building that we have here at the district has to have a tool supplied in order to do our jobs. And so the tool, small tools budget pays for new and replacement tools. Tools don't last forever, so you have to replace tools at the same time. And then we also do the maintenance of existing tools out of that out of that budget as well. Then you have raised rentals, leases, and permits. So there is jobs out there where we have to go out and rent things. I mean, you have to rent porta toilets, you have to rent saws sometimes, you have to rent vac truck. We don't have a vac truck at this time. A vac truck is something that can go out and dig a hole in a much smaller area than going out with a backhoe or excavator to do so. So there's a lot of things that we have to pay for and go, go and rent and lease. Uh, permits wise is we have county state permits that we have to abide by and have to have for most of our facilities. And so that also is in that budget. Then you have chemicals and lab supplies. Now when I say chemicals, I'm talking about polymer and polyphosphate, which are coagulants for the water system for, treated, for treating water and for water coming out of the wells. And then you also have chlorine in that. And so all of our treatment plants have chlorine injectors at them that disinfect the water pre-chlor and post-chlor coming out of our treatment plants. Then also at our wells, they're all chlorinated. As they come into the system, they're chlorinated. That is the disinfection and treatment of our wells going into the system. They do not actually go through a treatment plant. Then you go into the maintenance budget. And so this is maintenance of buildings and facilities, maintenance of our district vehicles, which you all know we have a lot of district vehicles. We have employees that have to get around. And it's maintenance of our safety equipment, which is very important here in order to stay up with OSHA standards and keep our guys safe and our people safe here at the district. Then you go to facilities. So facilities, it consists of the utilities, which is power and gas at all of our facilities. And then you have the communications in that budget as well, which is telephone, internet, and radio. So telephone is obviously here at the operations across the street at admin and at our treatment plants. We have telephones at all spots so we can all communicate. Internet is the same at all those facilities, plus we have to have internet at some of our um, remote locations in order to get communications back on tank levels um, to be able to tell pumps to come on and off to fill our tanks and that kind of thing and at the same time that's a radio equipment does that as well but we also have radios in our district trucks in order to communicate on the fly uh, we don't want people on the telephones driving around on the road so we have a mobile radio in the trucks which makes it makes it a lot easier to be able to drive around and talk to each other <coughs> Then you have the general administration. So that's office supplies. Office supplies consist of paper products, general office products, and cleaning supplies. 
Now this is ju not just for the two buildings that we have here in town. We have cleaning <coughs> supplies and all this paper products and everything at our treatment plants as well. People work out of these treatment plants on, the daily, on a daily basis. And they are staffed, so we have to have this stuff at every place. Also that comes out of that is our printers and everything that goes along with our printing and being able to use our computers at our remote locations and our treatment plants. Then you have subscriptions, certifications, trainings, conferences, and meetings. Now all this stuff is very important for our operators and our field staff due to the fact that we have to keep certifications in order to be operators of the water district. And you have to get continuing education units, and that is part of working here, and so as a district employee, we send people to classes and everything to get their CEUs to be able to keep up on their certificates. So they go to certain to trainings and conferences and meetings for all of this. Subscriptions is subscriptions is more along the lines of subscriptions for um, treatment treatment stuff. Um, that's more of the treatment and system uh, operators. They use a lot of subscriptions and mag magazines are huge in our in our in our you know what I mean. <laughs> in our department due to I mean up, upcoming and new rules and regulations that come out. And the op flow, there's a lot of them out there. You got op flow and other ones that are all important and good to keep up on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I didn't fit to the screen very well, but so this is um this is just a little bit about the SLBWD North and South system, and it consists of Boulder Creek. Brookdale, Ben Loman, Lompico, Ziani, Scotts Valley, and Manana Woods. It's a total of 6,506 connections. Then you have SLVWD Felton system, which consists of Felton. And the reason that the SLVWD Felton system is separate from the rest of the system is due to water rights issues. Um, it's harder to get a permit to combine the system. So, that is in the works. We are working with our state, and it will be done at one point, probably after the water rights issue is solved, and that is all in the works. So that is a total of 7,865 service connections. 7,865 service connections that are read monthly. And they are read by the customer service department, which is under Stephanie. But that is a lot of meters to read monthly, and we have one meter reader that does the whole thing. The district also has a total of 58 dedicated fire service connections. And so these are connections that are not regular domestic meters. They're connections that are either are a double meter at a house, just dedicated to fire sprinklers or fire service, or they're at a business and they are a fire service backflow going to a business. And so that's a total of 58 of those. Now, we have surface water treatment plants here at the district. The district has nine surface water intakes. Six spread across the Ben Loma Mountain on district watershed and three in Felton on, di on the district watershed. The, wa Lion water the Lion Surface Water Treatment Plant, located off Highway 9 236 on Redwood Drive at 365 Madrone Avenue in Boulder Creek, treats water from Sweetwater Creek Third Creek, Foreman Creek, and Peavine Creek. This plant consists of three filters. Units one and two were constructed in 1994 with the building of the Lyme Water Treatment Plant. Unit three was later constructed <coughs> in 1999. Then you have the Kirby surface, surface Water Treatment Plant that came with the uh, annexation of Felton. And that is located off Highway 9 and Kirby Street on 185 Kirby Street, Felt. This plant treats water from Bull Creek, Bennett Creek, and Fall Creek. There are two filters at this plant that were constructed in 1996. So all of our filters are pretty close to the same age. Um, there is two of the filters at Lion Surface Water Treatment Plant are in need of rehabilitation. And we are in the process of RFPing and getting out to bid for rehabilitation of these. 
And re by rehabilitation, I mean they need paintings and coats. Over time, the epoxy enamel paint begins to chip and wear, and it is starting to happen, and that is definitely a costly endeavor. This here is a picture, of, a couple pictures of our Kirby water treatment plant. Um, those are our backwash basins, our clear well, and the two back building sheds there. And you can see also that we have some, a lot of solar panels at the Kirby water treatment plant on the roof and off to the side. Mm -hmm. These are the filters at the Kirby water treatment plant. As you can see on this first picture here, um, there's a lot of equipment that goes to treating water. Every one of those chart recorders and the panels that are there are read daily, and there's many more of those at that treatment plant. And then the two filters, I know they're kind of hard pictures, they're hard to get, the filters are elevated, but so the, on the middle picture, that's the inlet side of the filter. It flows over the top and then goes into the filtration system on the other side and then gets distributed into the system after a post flow on the back side. This is another picture of the front side of the Kirby water treatment plant and more of our solar panels down the side of the building there. Here you have the lime water treatment plant. And that's a picture of the building there. And then you have our three, you can see a side clip of the three million gallon tank there. And we'll talk more about the tanks and recoatings and coatings and paintings. And obviously, we need some. <coughs> this is the inside of the line water treatment plant. These, they're up there, like I said, there's three filters. So the, on the picture on the right hand side over here, the far two are the two that are the older ones. They're the ones that were built in 1994. I hope I got that year right. <laughs> and then the one on the left side is the one that was put in 1999. Now we'll move on to Fall Creek Intake. Fall Creek Intake has bypass requir requirements. Normal rainfall, Fall Creek Intake bypass requirements. April 1st through October 31st is one cubic foot per second. One cubic foot of water is 7.48 gallons. And that's per second. So November 1st through March 31st is 1.5 cubic feet per second. In dry conditions, Fall Creek intake bypass requirements, April 1st through October 31st are 0.5 cubic feet per second. November 1st through March 31st is 0.75 cubic feet per second. San Lorenzo River USGS Big Trees Flow Requirements for Fall Creek are September, for the whole month of September, is 11 cubic feet per second going over the Big Trees gauge. What does that mean? What does what mean? <laughs> the intake bypass requirements. What is that? Well, this is, what that means is that we, as Bruce Holloway has mentioned many a times, <laughs> we violate that in the month of usually October and November. And that is the fact that we have to, let, there has to be that much water going, so I'll start with the USGS gauge. There has to be that much water going over the USGS gauge at that time in order for us to take water out of, out of all of them. This is the water that has to go before you take your water. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Correct. And so then in October, it goes to 26 cubic feet per second. November 1st through May 31st, 21 cubic feet per second. And June to August, there's no requirements. So why does it have to be more in October? So we're gonna, we're gonna hold questions. Oh, sorry. Well, I, was, I was actually just going back to October anyway. So obviously in October, it's very hard for the district to maintain and abide by this regulation. Usually the San Lorenzo Valley water does not get, the, the San Lorenzo Valley does not get rainfall before October. Every now and again, great now and again we do, and, but very seldom. So the majority of the time that we are in violation is October. Now it does run into November and December at times, because sometimes the San Lorenzo Valley doesn't see rain until January. So, but in order to keep Felton in water, we have to take water from Felton. We can't take water out of Felton, and we don't have water to give to Felton from the north system at this time. One way around that is to eventually get the Loch Loma water into the Felton water treatment plant. 
So this is the Fall Creek fish ladder intake. So down below are our bays that we have reconstructed and they're obviously very beautiful at this time of the year. And then right above this ladder structure here is our intake. And that's where our two intake pumps are. And it, that's what pumps the water over to Kirby Water Treatment Plant. So, <laughs> Fall Creek intake days of violation. So, vault, for the Fall Creek bypass flow number of days in violation, now that is the one CFS and the nor one CFS and 1.5 CFS in a normal rain year, and then the 0.5 CFS and the 0.75 in a dry rain year. Yeah, as you'll see, um, during the drought years was when we had problems. That's when we violated it during our drought years. I mean, it was very hard for us to do so. And this is in a total of 3,756 days that we have been operating Fall Creek Fish Line. The Felton system, I should say. And then on the other side, you see the big trees bypass flow numbers, days of violation. And there as well, you'll see that the big years that we have violated are the years where we were in drought years. We do, we have violated and we do violate in the years where we have water. I mean, it's inevitable. It is happening, um, it's 100% correct that we do need to work on our water rights and it's something that the district needs to get their feet into. Now we'll move on to district wells. All district wells are disinfected and treated at the wellhead. This means that they do not go through a treatment plant. They are chlorinated at the wellhead as they come out of the ground. A uh, quail well field it consists of quail well 4A, which was constructed in 2001, and quail well 5A, which was constructed in 2000. Quail well 4A has been pulled out of the ground and the pump and motor has been changed on that once since it's been in the ground. Quail well 5A has been pulled once as well and pump and motor has been changed. Quail well 5A is in the works of uh, being rehabilitated. And by rehabilitated, I mean it's, they're going to go in and pull the well out, and they're going to go in and do some jetting and some swabbing, and they may do some acid washing to the well in order to get iron and manganese off the well cult. The well has dropped in production, and it has been assessed, and that is the assessment is that it's plugged by iron and manganese. Then you move on to the Olympia well field. <clears throat> Olympia well tube was constructed in 1981. Olympia Well 2 has had been pulled and pumps and motors have been changed on it at least twice, that is to my knowledge. It has never been rehabilitated to my knowledge. Olympia Well 3 was constructed in 1990. It has also been pulled once and pump and motor had to be changed. They, these things do wear out and they usually have about a 10 to 15 year lifespan. We've had ones that have gone to the ground and lasted a lot less. Um, Olympia Well 3 is along with Quail 5A in the works of being rehabilitated. There is a, for those of you that have been in Board of you've probably heard about the RFP that's out and the contract with Martin Feeney mm -hmm. to get that going and get an RFP out and bid for rehabilitation of those two wells. The Paso Tiempo Well Field, which is down off of Grand Hill Road. Pasatempo Well 5A was constructed in 2012. This last year in 2018, we had a problem down the column where the screens had opened up and was allowing gravel and sand to come through the screens and be pumped up the column and into the system. So our Scotts Valley system was filled with rocks and sand. Uh, we immediately, immediately got calls of dirty water out there. We immediately turned off the well and went to pumping surface water through our new IT3 pump station, which is very convenient to the district to be able to put surface water down there when we have it. Um, so now Paso Well 5A is back in the ground and pumping back at full capacity. Paso Tampa Well 7 was constructed in 1990. Paso Well 7 was rehabilitated in 2018. It was acid washed, cleaned, discharged due to iron and manganese buildup. New pump and motor go, went in at the same time in 2018. Paso Tempio Well 8 is in construction. The well has been drilled, 
this is a replacement well for Paso Tampa well six that split a casing and had to be destroyed. We could not get it back in line. We tried swedging it. There was many repairs attempted at this well. No, nothing worked, nothing went well. So now we are in, still in construction on Paso Well 8. The hole's been drilled, the column's been set, and we just got approval from the state on our well pad and our piping plan there. So we are out to get a contractor in for our concrete pad and our building there. And that is in full swing. So there's a couple pictures of our wells. Um, the newer one there that you see with the new pad and the piping that's exposed doesn't have the cage on it yet is our past Temple Well 5A and that's when it was constructed in 2012. Those are pictures from there. The one in the lower left hand corner is our Olympia Well 2. Um, this has been a pretty good well to us. I do believe that this well was a earthquake replacement well. And then over here to the right you have Past the Tampa Well 7 and Quail Well 4 on the bottom. Moving on to district tanks. The district has 39 tank sites. A total of 52 tanks with 8.8 .8 million gallons of storage. The district has 20 steel tanks, 14 which are welded steel, 6 which are bolted steel. We have 15 redwood, redwood tanks that are in dire need of replacement. District also has 15 poly tanks out there. Poly tanks have been great to the district and good replacements to redwood tanks and that are small redwood tanks in small neighborhoods. We also have three concrete tanks. Um, these are big reservoirs. Two of them reside in the Scotts Valley area and one of them resides in the Heen, in the Heen Road area in Ben Lomond. So our deteriorating redwood tanks, nine of the 15 tanks are in the process of being replaced. Five of these are in the Lompico area and they're all in design. And that's replacing the Caskey tanks, which is two there, Madrone tanks, two there, and one at the, Lewis, at the Lewis site. And then we have two in the Felton area, and they're in the process of procuring easements. One of these is from a annexation of the Felton Heights system. And we, that tank has been needing to be replaced since we took over the system, and we are in the, per, in the process of getting easements. It's gone through legal, I do believe, and it is now in our engineer's hands. Then we have two in the Ben Loman area that are in design, and everybody probably knows about the swim tanks. We don't swim in them. <laughs> Uh, so they're up on the mountain off Scenic Drive, um, sitting on a very steep parcel there. So it is in design. We have went back to the table a little bit and we're talking about a few things on that and trying to figure out what we're going to do. It did go out to bid at one time, came back at three times the engineer's estimate as was pulled off the table. So then we get down to the painting and coatings on steel tanks. The district should start painting and coating two tanks a year to get the 16 tanks in need done in the next eight years. <clears throat> this is a very costly endeavor. It's about $200,000 to $250,000 a tank to paint and recoat. The life expectancy of paintings and coatings is 25 to 30 years. The majority of our steel tanks of the district are 30 plus years of age all the way up to 60 years of age on some of our steel tanks in our system. And never been painted and recoated. So here's a few pictures of our redwood tanks that we have in our system. I could have put a lot more pictures of redwood tanks, but I figured you see one, you see them all. <laughs> um, so there on the left hand side you got the swim tank. There's actually another tank up the hill above that, and that's that steep hillside where we have that <coughs> one that's in design. The one in the middle is our three echo tanks. Those are actually three old wine making tanks that were bought by the, by, they're actually bought by the people that ran the district out there before and installed them. And then on the right hand side you have the Madrone tank. No you don't. You have the Caskey tank. 
in Lompico. Here you have Highland Tank, which Bob Fultz is very <coughs> aware of. Zero water pressure. <laughs> I live right Since he the does live right across the street from the tank. And then over there you have the Felton Heights tank, and that is the one, that is a lined redwood tank, and it's been lined since we owned that system. It's got a bit of a wing to it. Here you have a few of our steel tanks. So on the left hand side you have McLeod tank, part of the Felton system. Um, in the middle there you have two of our newest tanks, which are the Nina tanks up on Nina Terrace. And then there on the right hand side you have Riverside Grove Tank, which is out north of town off Creek and Pine. Pine? I do believe. Um, these ones are in pretty good shape. The two on the ends are, are, are going to be due for paintings and recoatings at any time. Um, Riverside Grove Tank is an old tank, and I'm not really sure of the age of McLeod Tank. At least I'm getting some laughs. <laughs> so now we'll move on to district booster pump stations. The district has a total of 30 booster pump stations. Nine are block construction, 15 are wood construction. Five of these 15 wood construction are in dire need of replacement. Four have no structure around them. They're pumps on the ground or on a concrete pad. Exposed to the elements and everything else. These all need structures. One will have a structure as part of the swim tank project. It is one of the ones that's up there. It has just a roof over it. It's on a concrete pad with a roof over it. And then we have two pump stations that are also underground pit concrete vaults. I'm pretty sure that says six of these booster. <laughs> yeah, six of these booster stations have standby generators. The district also has three portable generators that are mobilized and shuffled around during power and power outages. The district is in need of more generators and at multiple <coughs> locations due to the new PG&E fire protection power shutdown and also to reduce man hours of moving generators back and forth during storm season power outages. So here's a couple of our, there's a few of our block boost pump stations. The one on the left is the one there on Highway 9 at Scenic Drive. The uh, one in the middle is out on Bear Creek Road on Ralston, Ralston Ridge. And the one on the right is on Nina Terrace, that is our Nina Boost Pump Station. Here's a couple of our wood structures. These are the um, couple of our better looking wood structures pump stations. Um, the one on the left is Mitchell Drive, north of town, here in Boulder Creek. And the one on the right is out Bear Creek Road, Huckleberry Woods. So, the operations department has a few different programs that they're involved in. And one of those starting is the meter changeout program. We started this up again in 2016 with the annexation of Lompico. First thing we did was went out there and changed all their meters over to a Badger meter system. Um, on average right now, we've been on an average of 500 meters a year, and this includes damaged and dead meters. Meters do die. They stop reading out. We don't get reads off them. They need to be changed out. Otherwise, we're average, um, estimating reads. And then meters also get damaged. There's heavy trucks out in our system. Garbage trucks are notorious for it, running over meter boxes and crushing meters. Once the meter's crushed, we don't get reads off anymore. So. 500 a year is pretty much our average that we're changing out. And we are switching over to the Badger meter system throughout the whole district. Then you have quarterly tank inspections. So every tank in the system, that's 52 tanks in the system, is inspected quarterly by district staff. It takes two people to go out and inspect every tank quarterly. There's ladders that you have to climb, and you have to have somebody watching out for somebody when they're on height, so that's why we sent two people as a safety issue. Then you have annual state system inspections, which is a state requirement. Also quarterly tank inspection of the state department. So each system, which we have two, 
and all of its facilities annually are inspected annually by a state inspector and usually myself and our um, treatment and system super supervisor goes out on these tours. Each treatment plant is also annually inspected by a state inspector and these are not at the same time as the system inspection. The treatment plant inspections are very intense and they go through every little thing that we do. Uh, right down to records and looking at our equipment, looking at our filters, checking everything out. It's a whole day process every time they go to each treatment plant. Then you have our laboratory, laboratory inspection every two years by the state lab inspector. Sometimes this doesn't happen. Um, they usually, sometimes they'll just grant us in when we're doing good and we don't have any problems at our lab. They don't have a problem. They'll just grant us a new permit and we just keep on rolling. The state standard has a valve exercise program. Every time we get state inspected, this is the first question he asks. Is did you guys start your valve exercise program? Well, we don't have the staff to do a valve exercise program. There is a lot of valves in a system with 190 miles of pipe in it. So the, dis the district exercises valves as needed, which means when we have a leak. So we need personnel to have a scheduled program, which at the same time, there's a lot of talk about a construction crew here at the district, and there's um, downtime for a construction crew in the wintertime, which would be a perfect time to have a valve exercise program. Then you have a flushing program here at the district. The district has a flushing program in the well field areas of the district. This takes three district personnel and three months to complete annually. This is a very tedious and long process. Um, this last year in our flushing program it was very rough in the Scotts Valley area because we had so much sand and gravel out in that area. And a lot of that sand and gravel went and settled in the main lines. So then when we did high velocity flushing, it all came out. And so we were at hydrants for extended period of time this, this year. So it may have taken a little bit longer this year than usual, but we got it complete. So we got program continued. And obviously our sampling programs that are state requirements take up a lot of programs. So you have weekly bacteriological samples in the systems. And that's every system that has to have a bacteriological sample taken out of it in every pressure zone. And depending on the size of the pressure zone, depends on how many samples have to be taken out of that system. Then you have monthly effluent at treatment plants. Effluent means water leaving the treatment plant going to the system. So they have to take a monthly sample of that and send it to an outside water analysis. And you have bi-monthly influent samples of the treatment plants, which means water, raw water coming into the treatment plant gets tested before it gets into our filters. And that's all sent out. The majority of these, I won't just say that these get sent out, the majority of these get sent out to outside water analysis. Then you have month, no, monthly bacteriological samples at surface or, water sources. You have month, monthly arsenic samples at the wells. You have quarterly iron, manganese, and bacteriological samples at all wells. You have annual nitrate samples at all wells. You have quarterly, you guys can all read that word for yourself, substances. <laughs> <laughs> samples, samples at raw water samples from wells. So it has to be the raw water. This is before it gets chlorinated at the wellhead. So there's a sample tap just below the, the actual infrastructure coming out, and that's where they pull that sample from. Lead and copper at customer taps every three years. Um, this is a volunteer thing for customers, and we reach out. It's not a volunteer thing for us. We have to get enough people to do so. And so our water treatment system supervisor reaches out to many people in the public, sends letters out and everything else. And your house has to be qualified for this as well. It can't just be like a new house. New houses are not qualified for this because they were never exposed to lead and copper. So this happens every three years and we usually get a pretty good turnout for this. We usually get enough people and we've never really struggled with that. Um, even when we had to do it in Lompico, we had more than enough volunteers to get it done. <laughs> then you have Title 22 samples every three years at the wells. And then you have unregulated contaminants monitoring rule every three to five years system wide.
So now we'll go on to quantity of district leaks and USA 811 utility locates. And district leaks, I didn't go back too far. I didn't want to make too many people compile too much information. <laughs> so 2017, we had 266 leaks repaired. That's more, more than what there is working days in a working year. 2018, 279 leaks repaired. To date, 2019, 88 leaks. These do not include leaks on the customer side that crews respond to that get called in. We get calls that there's water leaking and a lot of times it will be on the customer side and leaking down off the hillside or end of the road and we have to respond. Water's running, we respond. Then you have District USA 811 Utility Locates. Now what these are, just a little information of what these are, this is a free, a free, it's not free, it's free to the consumer. It's free to the consumer, I'm getting that, I'm trying to get that, to get that part up. This is a free to the consumer to call USA 811 when you're digging. And our obligation is to respond when we get one of these tickets. And as you can see, we get a lot of these tickets. And it's not just a year picked out where we got a lot of tickets. It's every year we get a lot of tickets. And we have to respond to every one of these out in the field. Some of them don't take very long. Some of them we write no district facility. But you have to respond and make sure there's no district facilities in the area. And district facilities goes as far as pipes in the ground and everything like that. So it's a lot of work for somebody to keep up on all the utility locates. Hmm. Water production. So surface water produced in 2017, 2018, and 2019 in the first quarter. Um, they all stay pretty, you know, we produce about the same amount of water every year. It doesn't really change much. Um, it did drop from 2013. 2013 is when state ordinance for drought reduction came in. And from those numbers, we do, we, they did drop a bit, but we usually create about the same amount of water. And after the first quarter of this year, we're right on track again. And miscellaneous. So environmental costs on district project. This is a very costly must to the district. Many of the areas of the Santa Cruz Mountains inhabit endangered species. The district must comply with federal and state regulations. Every project and every job site are different. That is why environmental review is important. Now, we have a system modeling a master plan that is in the works. Um, the district is, in, is very excited about this to be able to see what our infrastructure really is and what our fire protection in the district is. The system modeling is in the works and will tell us much needed information. Fire flow, undersized main lines, <coughs> hot spots for leaks, highly important improvements, and importance of infrastructure upgrades and replacements. Financial situation. The financial situation in the past has enabled the district to do upgrades and replace replacements to the system infrastructure. The rate structure now is great for the district and is allowing the district to move ahead with much needed infrastructure upgrades and replacements, catching up on deferred maintenance that has been ongoing. The end. Oh, man. Good job. Woo.
It is fish requirements, okay. and that's why they did set those standards back in the day. Nobody knows why they set them in October the way they did, but it's what is set, and we do violate it at this time. Okay. Um, most of our fish people that we do talk to are baffled by it as well. Okay. It's tied to the city. Right. City large water department has um, superior water rights to our water rights, oh. so it's tied to the city's. Okay, another question is, what is the valve exercising program? The valve exercising program is where the state wants us to go out and exercise our valve, our important valves of our system. In order to, exercising them means go out, full turn them, and make sure they're working and, okay. and working properly out in the field. And not break them in the process. And not break them in the process, exactly. Uh, Which a lot of them do break. Mm -hmm. All those are blanks? Okay. How would SLVWD recharge the aquifer? Details. Um, our biggest thing that we do now is sending surface water to our well field system. Um, that's keeping our wells offline, and we feel that we do a good job of recharging our our aquifers by doing so. Having the opportunity to be able to send surface water south to our well fields is huge for the aquifers. Why is Fall Creek water so good? <laughs> it's a great source. Um, there's no, there's not that many organic excellent watershed. Excellent watershed, and it's. Formation. You know, we don't have any problems with water quality there, and it makes it easy to treat, and it comes out of the treatment plant extraordinarily well. Are, they, are there any women working in the field? No. Or actually, I'll take that back. Yes. Carly goes out in the field. Do you have a cross-connection control specialist on staff? We do not have a cross connection control specialist on staff. Um, we do have a cross connection control program, and we are working on a cross connection control specialist. We have an employee that is very eager to become our cross connection control specialist. Let's wrap that up. I got two more. Okay. Okay, I'll wrap it up, boss. Sorry. <laughs> well said. Yeah, I'll answer these on post them. We'll post them. We need to move ahead. So, next up, um, uh, the Upper Ziani Stream Wood Enhancement Project Cooperative Agreement. Yes, we have. Uh, Program and environmental program manager Nicholson here that will take that item. Um, uh, so um, I'll take a brief history and then I think we'll turn it over to the RCD to give a presentation. So briefly, we've talked about this recently. Um, the we the San Lorenzo Valley Water District, the city of Santa Cruz and the RCD and the County of Santa Cruz have been working together collaboratively on a restoration project in the Upper Zayani watershed, which has been identified by the um, National Marine Fisheries Service as uh, the highest priority screen in the San Lorenzo River for coho recovery mm -hmm. and for steelhead recovery. And so the, the plan is to install large wood into the stream that 
um, has been denuded from large wood and it um, would enhance the stream bed or habitat. And, uh, and I think the presentation will get into more detail about that. And so I'd like to introduce Lisa Lurie, who is the director of the, the executive director of the RCD, the Resource Conservation District of Santa Cruz County, to do a presentation. Mm -hmm. And I will um, get that up and running. I'm sorry. Sorry. Oh, did you turn it off? Yeah. yeah, I did. I didn't know you were doing a presentation. Yeah. and Kelly Kamara, who's the technical director at the Resource Conservation District. And um, first, just by way of introduction, the, the RCD, we're a non-regulatory special district. We work throughout uh, the county of Santa Cruz with landowners, both public and private, on implementation of collaborative conservation. And what that means is really approaching conservation from a standpoint of understanding and meeting the needs and the goals and the, the values of the landowners, as well as understanding and meeting those values and goals of the common resources, whether it's water, air, soil, species, or habitat. And what we're here tonight to talk with you all about is one such project that we've been working on together with the Water District since about 2014 as well as a number of different partners. Um, so we have the RCD, the Water District, City of Santa Cruz, um, the County of Santa Cruz, NOAA Fisheries, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. We've had uh, support from a number of consultants, including Waterways and, and others, um, and have received funding through this project through the California State Coastal Conservancy, as well as the EPA and the State Water Quality Control Board. Okay, next slide. So this is the Upper Zianti Large Woody Debris Project. And overall, the, the purpose of the project, as Jen described, is to install habitat improvement structures along a one mile stretch of Zianti Creek that spans um, property of both the water district as well as the city of Santa Cruz. Um, and the goal is to really retain and filter sediment for protection of water quality, as well as um, improvement of habitat for coho and steelhead um, recovery. Um, next slide. So there's a lot of um, information here, um, and really it, it's meant to reflect the, the long background and history that we've had together on this project. Um, as Jen mentioned, back in 2012, this particular stretch of Zianti was really identified by the Fisheries Service as a top priority for coho uh, recovery. Coho recovery. Um, then in 2014, the County of Santa Cruz, um, together with the RCD and some watershed stewards, did a survey of Zianti Creek to um, further identify opportunity sites for um, water quality and habitat improvement. And that's where the San Lorenzo Valley Water District property and the city properties really surfaced as potential restoration sites. This, oh, sorry. Um, and this project has also been identified through a number of different um, collaborative efforts, including the San Lorenzo River 2025 initiative um, and the what's called the Integrated Watershed Restoration um, Program, which brings together different resource agencies to really come together and identify the highest conservation priorities across the county. And this project has um, been further identified for those groups. So back in 2014, your board authorized this project to take place on the property. Um, we then worked to secure funding through the California State Coastal Conservancy to fully fund the design and permitting of the project back in 2017. 
your board uh, in your district then uh, submitted a letter of support um, and commitment as part of a grant application that the RCD submitted to the State Water Quality Control Board, which we were then awarded in 2018. Um, this is a grant through what's called the 319H program. Um, it's money from the EPA that comes through the State Water Board and our Regional Water Quality Control Board um, for the purposes of projects to uh, protect and enhance water quality. So with those funds, um, we have been able to work to advance through the next steps of the, the permitting process and are now on, on the doorstep of the implementation. Um, at your October meeting, the board executed an access agreement, which initiated that permitting and um, implementation phase. So where are we now um, and where are we headed? Currently, the RCD is working to finalize the acquisition of all the necessary permits for the project. Um, this month, or, or this past month, we and our council have worked really diligently with your staff and your council, who I want to um, give a huge gratitude towards, um, for working towards mutually agreed upon terms of our, of our agreement. Um, we're happy to um, have worked through that. Um, and so the hope now is to enter into the cooperative agreement that's associated with the permitting and the implementation of the project that we can describe in a little bit more detail, to then um, be able to be an implementation of the project this summer. We have a contractor on board, and I'm happy to report that their bid actually came in below um, the, the budget for the project, so it's a pretty rare um, happy occurrence. Um, once the project is implemented uh, this summer, then the RCD and our partners uh, will be available and continue to assist in monitoring of the project um, for three to five years. So to talk a little bit about um, the, the return on investment here and really the mutual benefits of this project. Um, first, the project is, as I mentioned, 100% grant funded. Um, from the very concept through the, the implementation and the monitoring. Um, we've had a significant amount of public investment um, and commitment from the various partners to date. And really we are where we are because this project is of a mutual benefit both to the community and the natural resources as well as to the landowners, both your, the Water District and the City of Santa Cruz. Um, as it really aligns with the, the mission of the Water District to further advance your role as, as a steward of water resources. Um, so the mutual goals and benefits in terms of watershed stewardship, habitat improvement for coho and steelhead, as well as, as I mentioned, the water quality protection for the water resources that you identified. So Matt, I'm going to turn it over to give a little bit more detail and background on some of the um, finer points of the engineering of the, of the project. Is there a pointer available? Really long. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 All right, so um, my name is Matt Well, uh, Boulder Creek native. Uh, I'm a civil engineer. Uh, I specialize in ecological restoration of surface water environments, so rivers, streams, and wetlands. Um, I work with Waterways Consulting uh, based out of Santa Cruz and Portland, Oregon. Um, we do a whole lot of woody debris um, installation projects, mostly out of my Portland office because they've got more wood up there and they've got bigger rivers. Um, on this particular project, uh, my partner John Dvorsky, who's a widely recognized <coughs> uh, expert in this type of project, he's a fluvial geomorphologist and fisheries biologist, um, was the lead on the design. Um, woody debris installation is as much an art as it is a science. So <coughs> the engineering side is dealing with um, structural stability considerations, um, contracting, uh, plans and specifications, and uh, you know interactions with infrastructure. Uh, the geomorphologist, biologist role is uh, making sure that these are each individually um, designed and cited to have the best geomorphic function and habitat um, uh, enhancement uh, characteristics. So again, the project is a, addresses a one mile reach of Zyani Creek. Uh, the portion to occur on district properties is that orange box you can't see in the upper left there. It's a half a mile. Um, 
maybe uh, it's uh, it's all uh, within a fairly incised reach of the channel <laughs> that is, um, has a watershed dominated uh, um, within the riparian zone by redwood and fir. Uh, let's jump ahead to the next slide. Hopefully, we're zooming in a little bit. And, wow, purple. It's um, <laughs> not pretty. Yeah. Uh, those are a couple of uh, pictures within the study reach, and that's my partner John there during the survey. Um, some of the characteristics of this reach uh, it's less confined by the road relative to the downstream reach, which is on the city property. Um, channels vary in size um, and inset within um, former floodplain surfaces, meaning it's it's disconnected from those floodplain surfaces and it's very entrenched, narrow, high energy. Um, there's a very thin, this is important to this project, a very thin layer of alluvial materials, sands, gravels, cobbles, um, overlying the bedrock. In a lot of places um, on the banks you can see there, um, and in some places on the bed, the bedrock is exposed and there's no substrate. And we'll talk a little bit as we move forward about the importance of the substrate, um, the alluvial material. Um, the only places where you're finding pools right now are where the, stream, where the stream takes a really tight turn and abuts up against the bedrock surface and has the, the energy and the ability to scour a pool. And the pools are very important. Um, the reason these pools are limited is because the channel cannot effectively scour through bedrock. It lacks um, a sufficient depth of sediment um, to allow the physical formation of these pools. Uh, let's move forward to the next slide. Um, so some of the reasons um, that the channel is experiencing this current morphology are um, past road development, which has narrowed the available um, width of the valley floor for the stream and combined it to a, a straighter alignment, um, direct removal of large wood from the channel, um, I think it's important, um, when we say large wood, this is a large wood placement project, but this wood still isn't very large relative to the historic wood that this channel would have seen. Um, you can imagine back hundreds of years ago, you're going to have eight foot diameter redwood and fir trees falling in here. Um, one of those could back up this stream for hundreds of yards and completely change its character. Um, those are absent now, they're not available to the stream, and if they were to have fallen in the stream, they would be removed for flooding considerations or just um, salvage uh, for timber interests. So, uh, past forage management uh, practices have altered the stream. Um, you know, not so long ago, these, these hillsides were clear cut, um, and they're still recovering from that. Um, and then again, the loss of historic floodplain connectivity. Once they get straightened and once the watershed is altered and this incision process starts, the channels get deeper and they get narrower and then that process feeds on itself. The channel is deeper, the water flows deeper, it's got more energy and its ability to scour, removes the substrate and it gets stuck in one place uh, without that ability to use the floodplains to dissipate energy and deposit sediment. Um, as a result, some of the key ecological functions that have been lost within this reach are its ability to store sediment, um, its lost profile variability, meaning you don't see a lot of places where there's flat water and then a very deep pool and then a steep ripple and flat water. It's a very uniform channel bed which limits the variability and type of habitat available to the fish. Um, there's diminished complexity, the pools that do exist are infrequent and very shallow, and there's a loss of hyphoreic function at the riffles, meaning because the sediment within the channel is so shallow, <laughs> you don't have a lot of water flowing through the sediment, um, and that's very important to the ecological function. It, it creates um, upwelling within pools and better temperature gradients and improved habitat for fish. Um, and bugs. And bugs, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, next slide. So uh, some of the limiting factors for salmonids that have been identified in past studies, uh, meaning challenges to um, fish reaching their potential within this habitat include uh, lack of deep pools, lack of escape cover within the pools. So again, the only place pools happen out here typically are where there's a big smooth bedrock shelf that the channel is bumping up against. And because of that right angle and all that energy, the pool's been able to scour, but nothing grows on those um, steep, vertical rock banks. So there might be the water there for the fish, but there's nothing for them to hide under um, to avoid predation. 
Um, there's nothing for them to hide under at high flows, so young fish get flushed out in storms where they might otherwise have some shallow water on a floodplain to hide in or a log to hide underneath. Um, let's see, uh, secondary limiting factors which this project won't address include downstream passage barriers, dams, culverts, crossings that um, challenge the ability of fish to get up here, and then of course uh, low flows within the creeks. Um, one critical thing that does exist there is spawning habitat, and that's very important. So if we can give the place, the fish places to hang out and rear in these pools, um, it will, fish will be able to spawn there to take advantage of those pools. Uh, next slide. So some of the things that we consider when we're developing these um, woody debris placements, and I want to emphasize the fact, you know, the, these woody debris structures are really commonly accepted engineering practice now. Um, we've done several hundreds of them, um, and they're just uh, widely accepted. It wasn't that long ago. In fact, lots of my clients started their careers paying consultants like me to remove wood from creeks, and for the last 20 years, we realized that mistake and we're putting them back in. There's a lot of science behind it, a lot of engineering. Um, and some of the considerations at this particular site, um, we consider downstream constrictions like bridges, uh, adjacent infrastructure, roads, utilities, houses, and have to be cognizant of um, any impacts that placing wood in the creek might have on those sites. In some places, we just drop trees. Um, this site, we have too many uh, constraints, so we're being really careful with their placement and anchoring. Um, other considerations were access within this uh, upstream reach. Most of the sites have existing um, dirt access paths that we can utilize, and where we don't have those available to us, we're using other techniques that don't require heavy equipment. Um, a challenge up there is that the trees are generally smaller, so we're having to go off site to get some logs that are big enough to be stable. <laughs> um, some specific op opportunities there is that there's one landowner that makes uh, contracting, permitting, and coming to some agreement a lot easier than a lot of our sites um, when you're dealing with 20 landowners getting everybody on the same page is top. So that's a unique opportunity in a site like this. Um, we've got a great, healthy riparian corridor. Um, so we can salvage trees without any significant impacts um, to the riparian areas on either side of the creek. Um, these bedrock controls, though they lack cover right now, they do create scour, which is a really good opportunity for us to take advantage of existing pools and enhance them with wood. Um, and again, we are uh, away from existing infrastructure. So risks are really low up here, which is nice. Uh, and the availability of wood. Next slide. I know I'm going really fast, but it's late, and I'm sure you, <laughs> everybody wants to get through this. Um, <laughs> So some details of the proposed enhancements. You can see this slide a little better. Those um, purple, green, and red dots um, represent the structures. Um, gosh, Mountain Charlie Gulch is coming in on the upper right-hand side of the page there, and the creek flows from left to right. And you can see Zianni Road sort of is that um, dashed black line, and um, the two bridge crossings where the blue line, which is the creek, crosses the black line. Um, so there's a total of 12 structures of three different types, the green, purple, and red. Um, eight of those are accessible with heavy equipment and four of them only with hand tools. Um, we propose three different structural details to be employed at these sites based on accessibility, availability of local wood, and um, opportunities for anchoring stable um, structures at the site. They can be anchored using a lot of different techniques including bolting logs to each other, um, wrapping logs around existing standing trees and bolting them, uh, burying what we call piling logs or vertical logs that are stuck down into the dirt and use frictional resistance. Um, we connect them to large boulders which are buried and then chained to the logs. Um, and we use combinations of all those. And then in addition, sometimes we get really large trees that are just, um, they have a significant portion of the wood <laughs> up above the 100 year storm that counteracts the buoyant force on, on the trees. Um, so again, three structures, structure types proposed, and I'll show you those. Um, but each of those structure types will be a little bit customized at each of the sites. Um, let's move ahead to the next slide. 
Um, this is type 2 structure. Um, type 2 structures are used where there are existing trees to anchor to. Um, and these ones are used to enhance existing pools. And so you can see some structures, some of the logs will have root logs, others will not. Um, they'll be wrapped around trees on the upper bank and then bolted to make a triangular shaped structure with a good, with a pretty significant portion of the structure up above the water so that the weight of the logs counteracts the buoyancy. Next. Um, this structure here is uh, used where there is higher risk. So you can see the boulders there that would be chained to logs and used to weight them down. And then in addition, we would fall one um, large local tree with branches intact over the type of the structure. Um, let's see, what do we say about this one? Um, a portion of it would be buried into the stream banks. I think it's important to note that any place where we use boulders that's back up on the bank and they're buried to be out of sight. Um, so these structures last 30 years. When the logs rot and disintegrate, you're not left with boulders sticking up above. They're buried down under the sand or into the earth in the banks. Next slide. Um, habitat structure type 3 is used where we have large locally available trees um, that we can fall in place. Um, and again, those uh, will be, a, a large portion of them will be up above the creek bed, but they'll be used in conjunction with some trees that are imported and bolted together. Uh, next. So um, type 4, finally, type 4 is a combination of, um, I'm sorry, I, I jumped ahead. Type, type 4 is a, will be all trees are greater than 100 feet long. So these trees will be using their the weight of the log entirely and bolting to one another to be anchored in place. There's no um, boulders or anything of that nature. Just the size of the tree itself is sufficient. Um, they're at least twice the active channel width, so typically 100 feet or greater. Um, so they're basically considered too large for the creek to move. They'll either be cut or pushed over depending on access availability. When we can push them over with heavy equipment, it allows us to keep the root wad intact, which is, um, adds a whole lot of additional weight that's very dense. And some, um, the root wads, as big as they are, their cross-sectional area really enhances the ability for the river to scour against them and provides some good hiding opportunity for small fish. Next. Okay, so um, the expected outcome of these structures um, they're really expected to pinch the channel off and cause coarse sediment to aggrade or build up upstream of them. Um, they will enhance pool scour to get deeper pools, more uh, hyperreic flow, um, add additional pools. They will, ideally, they will accumulate naturally supplied wood. So typically when we install these structures, we might put four to six logs there after the first big event you're going to see all kinds of smaller sticks and little logs that are naturally mobilized through the stream rack up on them makes the structures less porous and improves their effectiveness um, we think that uh, they will increase habitat complexity and high flow refuge habitat again um, we expect them to last about 30 years um, there's going to be a lot of variability there based on the trees that are selected and the extent to which they wet and dry or are exposed to sun or other um, degrading factors, but 30 years is a pretty reasonable estimate. And then as they degrade, um, like all wood in the creek, um, they will start to soften and crumble and fall apart and the, the thinner portions break off first in small chunks. And, float away or rot right into the ground. Um, so basically there's no demolition or removal or repair or replacement. You just let them degrade in place. Uh, next slide. Um, this is going to be a little tough, um, but these are some photos that are examples of past projects. Um, I just wanted to show you some of the effects. Um, the top right photo is um, you can see in the center is a wood jam there and the river is flowing left to right. And you can see the gradient there and all the stored sediment, the cobble gravel in the foreground and then the um, cascade that's formed as the water goes around the structure. Um, at the bottom left you can see a structure that's pinching the creek and resulted in a nice pool scour. 
Um, and this is a channel with a width of about 40 feet, pretty similar to Zyani. Uh, next slide. Sorry, everything's so purple. <laughs> um, you know, uh, this is a channel width of 85 to 100 feet. So top right, you can see a place where we use two structures to pinch and narrow the channel. And you can see the white water there. Um, what's basically happening is by pitching it at high flows, we get nice pool scour in between the structures. Um, again, this is, you know, I know that maintenance is a consideration for you guys. Um, so I want to highlight, you know, this was installed in 2012. To date, no maintenance required. Uh, same with the prior slide, no maintenance required. Um, next slide, please. Um, this one was installed in 2015. Um, this is all of these are in Oregon, which has had some really big winters, and these are being constantly monitored. Um, they've held up really well and no maintenance. Uh, top right is these are more aggressive structures. They span the entire channel so that they have a greater effect at high flow. The more you pinch this channel off, the more hydraulic effect they have. So the top right picture, you can see pooled water up above it. Um, and then you can see it's formed somewhat of a weir. And again, you know. These are installed in places where the creeks were really boring and flat and straight. And so you, what you're really seeing here is complexity. And I'm not showing you the before picture, but if you see Zyani right now, it's pretty boring. And what you get is this. You get um, pools in the background and scour downstream of the structures. And you get um, variability in habitat type. Uh, next. Uh, this is a creek that's 75 to 100 feet across, and you can see the bottom left, we sort of push the water over to the side. Um, bottom right, we've built uh, an entire jam that's forcing water out on the floodplains to provide um, rearing habitat for coho. Um, the top right, you can barely see it, but you can see these vertical <coughs> tiles that are an example of one of the anchoring techniques. Um, this one was installed in 2017 on a creek that's about 100 feet wide. Uh, next. <coughs> Johnson Creek, uh, there's a, a very aggressive application there where we basically blocked the channel and you can see the calm water downstream of it, and, which is indicative of a very deep blue scoured pool. Well, I have a question about blocking the whole stream. Now over the years, that doesn't block up enough to where the fish can't even get by it? No, um, these structures, uh, they provide lots of open space underneath. within the logs, underneath and around. Um, you know, basically there have been all kinds of studies that there is no upper limit to the amount of wood you can add um, and, and derive additional fish habitat benefits. Um, there are very few instances where, um, you know, at low flow, really low flow conditions, if you block the whole stream, it can plug up. But they tend to, um, as with beaver dams, the fish will find little interstices to get through. Um, next. And that, that was a common misconception, not that, you know, 20 years ago people were going out and blasting these things and removing them for fear of fish flat, uh, passive barriers. Um, so, you know, I was asked to discuss maintenance and uh, I met with my partners and we talked and talked about it. We couldn't come up with an example of where we've ever had to do any. Um, but we did find this uh, NRCS standard practice here which provides some general recommendations um, from a similar project that was done locally. Um, you know, most of the maintenance is uh, the access roads that you use to get in and out um, was the erosion control effective. Um, so uh, at this particular site, our concerns there are really minimal. They're existing roads, you know, we're going to uh, clear them to get in and out and then we're going to uh, treat them for erosion with standard construction practices. Um, inspect banks for sloughing, so bank erosion. These sites were all selected uh, at locations where bank erosion is not not only is it not a problem, it's desired. Natural bank erosion um, allows the creek to extend its <coughs> length and to develop a pool scout, basically. So um, bank erosion would be a benefit here. Um, you know, you periodically inspect them for movement and uh, consult with engineers and RCD if necessary. We do not, again, expect any of these particular structures to move because they're anchored, they're engineered with uh, high factors of safety against buoyancy <coughs> Um, and, you know, one thing that's important to point out is success criteria for these types of structures. Just hitting more wood in the creek is considered success. So lots of times we do these projects and they're federally or state funded 
and people build these really complex jams and they don't do any anchoring because they're in places where risk is allowable. They fall apart and the people that paid for them still consider that a success because there's more wood in the creek and wherever it lands, it provides benefit. So it's not like if there's a movement or a log shifts, it's broken and you need to fix it. Um, that's important to understand. Uh, again, it's kind of an art as much as it is a science and we take our best stab at what these things should look like. Sometimes we're wrong and sometimes they move and get better. Um, so. Conditions should be evaluated compared to desired conditions on a regular basis to be able to quickly adjust the conservation plan to ensure desired habitat conditions are met. Yeah. Pretty, pretty vague stuff. Um, worst case scenario, um, you know, sometimes if you put them on a flatter creek where flooding is a concern and they rack too much wood, you might want to get out there and look at them and say, hey, we should cut a few of these logs into smaller pieces so if they break, they don't cause any damage downstream. Here, not a concern given that we're anchoring and the creek is so small relative to the size of the creek. <coughs> Next. Um, that's you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a few questions that come up when we um, presented at the Environmental Committee just a few weeks ago. So we want to be sure to address this head on and make sure that um, all those uh, questions and concerns were, were addressed. So again, in terms of the maintenance, what I also want to add is as I described before, our whole approach to conservation is a collaborative approach with landowners. We've been around since 1942, and we've implemented hundreds of projects across the county, all through partnerships with private and public landowners. And so we, we are partners in these projects. We don't simply implement and walk away. We are a continual resource in terms of ongoing discussions um, to for any sort of problem solving that might come up down the road. Um, but as was discussed, these are really designed to evolve naturally um, and not really require any sort of concerted effort. Um, so just to summarize and wrap, wrap up, again, I do really want to thank staff and council for working with us over the past month um, to, to respond to concerns. Um, you know, I've, I've heard um, also a, you know, a really understandable and legitimate concern and interest in minimizing risk and liability of the district. District, And I will just say, as executive director of a small public agency myself, I share and understand that concern. Um, and so at the RCD, what we do to minimize our risk is we work with really highly qualified and trained and experienced engineers and contractors we use the best available science. We bring all the expertise to, to bear on the project. We design to the highest standard, and we really take into consideration those site-specific needs and constraints. So that's something that I personally and our agency really value and bring to this type of work. Um, and together with your staff, we've been able to make sure that the, the, the language and shared um, responsibility and um, are really kind of incorporated in a um, mutually acceptable way um, in our agreements. So we're really happy with um, how we've been able to work together on that. Um, we're here because this project is really broadly recognized as a high priority for habitat conservation as well as for water quality. As I mentioned, there's been a significant amount of investment and partner commitment to date. And this is a really a mutually benefit project that aligns um, as well with the goals and objectives of your district. So with that, um, we see that this has a real high return on investment. We're grateful for your partnership to date. Um, and we'll leave it at that. Okay. Um, I'd, I'd like uh, and Gina to Talk to there was several questions at the last meeting regarding the agreement. Yes. And the agreement's gone back and forth yeah. through legal counsel and tried to address uh, a lot of those concerns uh, right up to um, we had some, uh, one of the board members had additional questions and Gina tried to answer late this afternoon. I think that she's um, prepared to, to answer some of those questions as well. But I do believe legal counsel, has, I won't speak to legal counsel, but uh, we have you know, come to an agreement with you for the, for the agreement. Um, and you know, we believe, I, uh, 
then it's, it's time to uh, recommend executing uh, this cooperative agreement and move forward. Uh, I won't speak for Dean and I'll let her move ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think one of the things that I struggled with in, initially in looking at this agreement is that it includes some sort of vague language that carries over from the fact that it's a form agreement that doesn't fit incredibly well to these specific circumstances. But the main changes that were made um, <coughs> working with uh, the RCD were one, to, to try to clarify, and there's still some ambiguity in here, I'll admit, but to try to clarify the district district's role and most importantly, the fact that the district isn't involved in the construction of the project. So I think we've succeeded in making that clear. And on the indemnity front also, um, there originally was a, I believe it was an indemnification of by the district for others involved in the project, and that has been modified in a way to make it much more appropriate to the type of arrangement that it is where, because we're not involved in the construction, we're fully indemnified for everything related to the construction. And then there is a um, mutual indemnity for things that occur um, after construction, apart from the construction, um, where um, if a third party were to sue either um, any of the parties to this agreement, um, they, they were, there is a right of indemnity vis-a-vis um, -vis each other for the other parties' negligent, negligence, breach of contract, uh, I think willful misconduct, etc. So it's a pretty typical mutual indemnity, and it's limited only to the issues that don't relate to the construction of the project, since the district is not doing the construction. And there are a few other changes here and there, but those were the most significant operations. I think the other concern was maintenance and speaking uh, with the RCD on their past project maintenance is almost non existent. So it's, it's hard for just to get the value out of that. But I don't think there's no period with much of any maintenance. Okay. Well, sounds like a good deal to me. I, I think I, I think we talked about this before at the environmental committee. I want this project to go forward. Uh, the only issue has been around the cooperative agreement from my point of view, um, and making sure that it reflects what we um, want to do. So where I'm still confused is what is our responsibility with respect to the conservation plan and maintenance specifications? What is it that we have to do specifically, specific performance, in order to make sure that we're protected later on should something happen? And that's not particularly spelled out here, I don't think. At least I couldn't find anything. The conservation plan is mentioned twice, once capitalized, once not. The maintenance specifications are mentioned here as well, but I don't see anything for that. So I don't know what we're signing up for yet, other than something that's specified here. Can, can, can you help with that? Sure. So the, the final two pages in that agreement include the practice standards from the NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service. That includes reference to the, um, the maintenance obligations, which is what we put on the slide up here. Um, so that's, I mean, that is the greatest detail in terms of the, the maintenance obligations that are spelled So it, it says here periodically check yeah, roads. It says periodically check <coughs> roads for erosion. What's involved with that? What do we have to do? What money do we have to spend? What's periodic mean? Is it every year, every two years, every five years? Um, periodically expect banks for sloughing. What, what I'm trying to make sure we understand is what are we collectively signing up future boards to have to put in the budget that is an absolute requirement that they have to do on some periodic basis. Because in order for this to be a successful project, we want to make sure we're doing what's needed to be done to make it successful. And I, and if we find something that is eroded or sloughed or moved, what do we do? What do we spend? How do we deal with that. I, I, don't, I don't know how to put my arms around it. 
And if it's nothing more than put it in the water, put it in the creek, and just let it do its thing, as I think we were talking about during your presentation, then we should just spell that out, that all we're doing is putting it in there, and basically it's going to do what it's going to do. That's not what is said right now. So monitoring uh, erosion in roads and would, would be something that is just part of the district's ongoing operations. We hire a consultant to go out on all of our watershed lands on all the roads and do uh, annual inspection and where, when necessary put in a couple of water bars. It's a minimal cost and it's something that we do as an ongoing um, annual effort for our just maintaining our lanes. I can but, also but this clarify is, this is different than that, from right? a permitting perspective. And the cooperator agreement is referring to our coordinated permit programs and permit issues to the resource conservation district. We, the, we as the RCB will be taking on monitoring for the three to five years that's required as part of our permits to ensure that the project is functioning as planned that the revegetation efforts that we have spelled out are um, are functioning as they should, and that no new invasive species have colonized the site, which is one of our CEQA mitigation requirements. Um, so we will be performing um, the inspection twice during the first rainy season, and then annually thereafter for the three to five years until we say, yes, the system is performing as we have anticipated um, after that, then I think it's a little bit more of just checking in and making sure that, and I know you want to know if that's you or if that's us, um, once, we, once we walk away after the five years we're saying it's functioning, um, with any site or project, um, you want to keep an eye on it and <coughs> sort of have in your back of your mind that um, you know, we, we, we do all this planning, we implement, we watch it, and then we always need to say, is there ever any adaptive management going to be needed in the future? And I think that's what Jen is alluding to, is in terms of like, you're already managing and watching your lands. And if we see something is happening, that is when this collaboration and mutual agreement of moving forward is coming into play and just working collaboratively and then determining what is the best course of action based on what we see and what we didn't anticipate or has come up at some time in the future. I, I would like to move forward on this. I think we've talked it to death. I, I have a couple of specific amendments I'd like to make to the agreement. Uh, to put a better clarifying. I don't know about that. What do you think about that, Gina? Well, that may be possible. I, I'm not. If the board were to give us direction to request the amendments that. Request them. I think there's there's some clarification. So let me give you an example. Uh, the first page, authorized participation of projects. It says here, if the cooperators or their agents do not carry out work consistent, we're not really doing the work there. Our, the RCD is doing the work. I'm not sure why I didn't say it's RCD, SCC, instead of us. And then on the conservation plan, I don't know what that conservation plan is. I, I, there is nothing, there's the maintenance, I guess, which is what you talked about. I don't know what the conservation plan is. The conservation plan is the two pages referred to in Exhibit B of the practice requirements, which are for okay. issued from the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Bill? Um, I, I, I just have some comments. <laughs> I know that wood, if, wood, if wood stays submerged, it lasts a long time. So anyway, I think these things will actually last a little bit longer. And then I hope you're using stainless steel. But, and then another thought I had is actually to maybe have some fake, uh, like concrete blocks, um, or some, so, something that might actually, engineering-wise, actually last longer. Because like again, like you said, that you would also get other logs are gonna fall into the creek. You know, I'm just interested in uh, maybe looking, you know, thinking out of the box of making these things so that they would serve the same purpose but actually last longer. So in other words, in 30 years we won't have to come back and do more work to that there might be some thought put into um, 
but I, anyway, I, 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 I got a question. I don't have any problem with anything. I, I want to. Uh, if you do concrete, how do the fish get through it? Well, I'm just thinking out of the box. I'm thinking about you know having some fake trees that are concrete that are going to last you know 100 years. Yeah, but we need. And then you would still have some natural wood too that would collect in there too, but it would still, you know, the fish should be able to, Yeah, well, you know, that'd be up to the contractors, I guess. Well, no, we can't, it's too late in the game. It's, it's too late in the game, yeah. 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 I have no idea. I think, uh, I like the design, but as long as you're using possible. stainless steel, and then that wood that's, you know, you're still in the air, the wood stays submerged, less, I think they're going to last a little bit longer, actually. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the, yeah, the lifespan will vary again yeah. depending on, yeah, that submergence and drying. And a lot of them are up high. Some of them are buried, so the, the portions that are exposed to that wetting and drying will yeah, deteriorate just, faster. Because you're going to be doing the other one. I just, just, I just want to make that comment. Yeah. So, Thank you. Yeah. So, I, okay. Okay. Just one on the, this is fully funded, right, with grants and everything? Mm -hmm. Yes. And the, the, the names. Of the no, of, but of the of the, the twelve sections that you've got here, everything refers to it's, it's being paid by uh, reference to this section fifteen thousand. Mm -hmm. But some of the other ones talk about uh, you know there will be like for mobilization and demobilization there'll be a payment that's called a <coughs> sum, whereas the other one said no separate payment will be made, et cetera, et cetera. It's covered under fifteen thousand. So are, are there additional payments to be made for these other some of these other sections that are referred to? Or is that all covered under They're the They're all plan? covered under the same cost bid schedule that the contract selected contractor has filled out. Yeah. Okay. 100%. Super. Great. Uh, Let's go. Let's go. Uh, yeah, some, I'm with you. Put some wood in the brick string. Okay, Lou. Just a quick question. Uh, after the wood install, how long before you typically see the desired effect of scouring and pooling? Mm -hmm. Ma so, yeah. Maximum effect. Yeah, it's really going to be dependent on what type of storm events we get. So What's your experience? What, what would you guess it to be? Uh, yeah, these one are, season. These are down in a place where they're going to interact with, you know, uh, I would say five years if I had to guess. So it's got to be a storm big enough to move large sediment, smaller sediment, gravels, sands, silts. They're going to go right by this and not even notice it. Um, we have we have to sort of balance uh, our occlusion or blocking of the channel um, for habitat benefit against the need for flood conveyance, right? So we didn't completely block the channel. Um, so that means that these things are really only going to work in very large events. So the first time we get a nice, nice gully washer, you're going to see some, some big changes happen. But you said you're only going to be monitoring this for three years, so if it takes five years for max effect, don't we want to monitor it a little bit longer? So our permit is a, that we'll monitor it for three to five years or until our success criteria is met. For most projects, we do see it within that time frame. Okay. So I don't normally make a motion, but I want to make one that we need to approve this. Could I say something? Oh, public comment, yes. Okay. Can I say something? <clears throat> um, Rick Moran from uh, Ben Long. Uh, I was on the environmental committee when this was brought up a number of years ago, and uh, I was glad to learn about it. I visited the site up here, and um, it's a it seemed like a great site for your program. And I have a friend of mine, uh, Mike Henry, who I've known for a long time, and he's a fish biologist, and I've talked to him about this ever since I was in the environmental committee. And he's seen the success of these things and he highly re recommends it as being an effective way to help repopulate fish. And uh, I fully support this program and would love to see coho salmon back in the San Lorenzo River. And, and steelhead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, Virgil, you wanted to say something? Yes, uh, we've all benefited from um, Director Fultz's you know, thoroughness, and we should thank him for that. But we also need to remember this needs a quorum, not complete agreement by all directors. And if the, the quorum is in favor of this, let's move on. Thank you. Anybody else want to say something? Okay, I, all right. So may I make a motion that we accept this contract to do the Upper Ziani Streamwood Enhancement Project Cooperative Agreement? Okay. What is it? Can you offer a clarification? Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
if you could uh, reword your motion to approve the call. Okay, manager, the motion. And um, authorize yeah. the authorize. district manager to sign it on behalf of the district. Correct. So Otherwise, you would have to sign it. Is, is it in here? Would you say it for me, please? <laughs> yes. Um, motion to uh, author to approve the cooperator agreement and authorize the district manager to sign on behalf of the district. Oh, I didn't say for him to sign. Oh, second. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Holly, you want to call the question? Director Smallman? Aye. Director Swan? Yes, sorry. I'm sorry, I forgot. <laughs> Director Ferris. Aye. President Henry. Yes. And Director Pulse. Yes. Okay. You know, it is so, it is, okay, so late, and we need, and, um, the grand jury, um, we need to ask for an extension. They want an answer on this by May 17th. So could we just not deal with this tonight and ask for an extension? Yes, we can ask for an extension. Um, what I would request is that um, I also be authorized to start drafting a response along the lines of what I suggested in the memo. Yes. So that if they don't grant the extension, I have something to show you at the next meeting. Okay. I mean, we've done. We've done some of it. Well, no, I think we've done more than what has been. Uh, what had been previously done. Charter makes it an almost yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, the charter. And they're working on the financial report also. Hopefully it will be out by June. So. Well, I think we more than fulfilled it. Okay. Uh, Excuse me. Yeah. Yes. Yes. There are a few things that are not being met yet. Right. So I don't want a blanket statement that we have met everything and gone beyond because there are certainly things that are still in the process. Of course. There is the intent that they have not been completed. Can I speak on this grand jury thing? Please? Sure. Okay. Um, I have, uh, there's a recommendation eight, if you've all read this, and it's about uh, the staff and managers and everybody should have training. The district should provide formal training to all board committee members and senior staff on how to communicate with public on contentious issues. Um, I've stayed here from 10 o'clock to speak on this. Uh, this needs to be done. I've asked uh, other director, I've asked a director to speak on this before. Um, it's changed its direction. Um, the issue of dealing with contentious issues by all of us here needs to be addressed and it needs to be addressed by professional people who will do a personal interactive training. Um, I've been a school teacher, I've been a lot of things, and I've always needed to have training. We all need training. You even had training so far. You've had your ethics training, your board training, some sensitivity training. We all need training. And we've uh, had Brown Act training. Yes. All right. So I recommended earlier um, a lady that I know who does this kind of work, Jen Davis Turner, in, uh, consultant. All right. And at a uh, community chat with you and Rick, uh, this was also brought up. And um, Mark Lee had a recommendation of some people that deal with contentious issue uh, training. Um, this needs to, I'm, my notes late and stuff like that, but this has gone on too long. We've experienced, in the last three months, we've experienced contentious issues that could have saved some people some a lot of heartache, but it's, it's got to be tackled now and not delayed any longer. Thank you. Righty. Um. And I, you know what, I, I don't want to do, can we wait till the next meeting to do poor board and public member committee comments? I don't think it's any depressing. Uh, hmm? No, we can wait. 
nothing's pressed. I don't, I don't believe it's yeah. that. Yeah, it's getting too late to be reasonable. Uh, and the minutes are on the consent agenda, so if nobody pulls um, the minutes out to talk about them, then we can just vote on them, right? You don't even have to vote on them. Okay, yeah. we don't have to but vote on them. Check, I recommend checking to see if any board member remember. The you want to pull minutes? You, you, you. Okay, okay. So, and there are written communications uh, attached to the agenda. You might want to make sure that you read them. And thanks. Yes, sir. Oh, on the important committee member <coughs> assignments uh, on the uh, Lampico Oversight Committee, we have recently have openings, and on the budget and finance, we have public member openings. I'd, I'd like to get approval to move ahead with advertising to fill those because it will be another couple of weeks before sure. we go back in front of the board, and then that'll be another you know three or four weeks before we can get. Right. So I'd like to at least get four approval to move ahead. Is there a board consensus? Is there a board consensus yeah. to um, do that? On advertising. Uh, really what, Holly? I was just going to say there's an additional um, public member now if we want to replace uh, Mr. Ferris on uh, engineering. Yeah. So that would be um, another right yeah. another position. So the board has an right. Well, I ahead. think it's pretty obvious we'll put him on the engineering. <laughs> well, well no, there is, that leaves a, a space. Yeah, it leaves a space of public members. Public we like to just move ahead and advertise for all public members. Yeah. Open <clears on open <clears <throat> right, right. It's just part of normal operation. When they become available, it's just part of normal operation. Yeah. 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 Just the clarification. I think one of the reasons we discussed putting it on the agenda was because the, the process that the board has adopted that allows committee size to vary to accommodate right. public members mm -hmm. could put us in a situation where like maybe you get five applicants in January and you want to put them all on a committee and so the committee grows to seven but then some people drop off. You may want to think about when folks resign, whether you automatically want to post to refill seven positions or at that time shrink the committee down to a smaller size. So that's why we suggested coming back to you to check in about the size of the committees and whether to post for all the seats that are open or whether to change shrink the size of the committee well part of the trouble with having seven on a committee is it takes what four for four we don't at this point we don't have any more than five yeah, yeah we, we don't have any more and, and, I, and my opinion <laughs> is at this point i think we need to advertise for the level that we had previously <laughs> okay all right I just wanted, because we did end up addressing the agenda item, I just wanted to check, um, President Henry, if there are public comments that need to be taken from this item. Is there any public <laughs> comment out there? Don't you dare say a word. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, maybe I no, if you really want to say something, make it good. <laughs> Did the sharks win? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. All right. Can we adjourn? Did we cover everything? Falling? Yes. <laughs> okay. We're going to adjourn at 10 or 10 or whatever time. Stay away. Good job.